Hello guys, my name is Vijay and in this whole course all we're gonna talk about is Kotlin. Well, if you are doing some sort of Android development or some sort of Java development then you might be, I can promise you, will be a little bit of aware about uh, what Kotlin is. So still let me just give you an introduction. Well, Kotlin is a general purpose uh, programming language uh, released by JetBrains uh, 1.0 last year uh, from then um, Kotlin just picked up now Kotlin has a first class support for all the Android uh, development so you can actually use Kotlin for you know Android development instead of Java so that was like kind of the introduction I'm pretty sure you guys are aware still I'm just going to give you the detailed introduction you know what uh, actually Kotlin consists of and how to use and where to use and who is using it and all those kind of things just stay with me so okay first of all what is Kotlin so Kotlin is a general purpose programming language uh, what does that mean even well if you are a programmer then you might know but still let me give you a you know a little bit of uh, overview what uh, general purpose means uh, general purpose means uh, pro, uh, in terms of programming language uh, is it's not binded with any uh, domain specific uh, uh, knowledge uh, as per you can say uh, for example a lot of programming languages are just for Android a uh, lot of programming languages are just for network programming or just for graphic programming you know those kind of things um, but Kotlin is uh, not one of those languages so you can uh, so the thing is you can actually use Kotlin for all those kind of purposes you know you can build servers using Kotlin you can build mobile applications using Kotlin you can build uh, shell scripts or uh, you know custom uh, tools with Kotlin uh, you can build automated scripts with Kotlin uh, almost anything you can think of when you when it comes to programming you can actually build with Kotlin you can build databases you can build system softwares uh, in short, uh, that's I think the main uh, of general purpose, you know. So Kotlin is one of those languages. Um, so if you if you learn once, then you can use it on variety of softwares. One of the really good thing and I, I the thing that I admire about Kotlin is it's statically typed. I love statically typed languages. Why? Because more than fifty percent of the error whenever you are doing the software development get cuts off just by using statically type languages for example if you are using javascript by the way javascript is a great language i don't have anything against it but it's kind of dynamically type language so what happens is if you, if you are running some sort of um, uh, function uh, and you are expecting integer right now when you compile the program in javascript it won't check uh, the compiler won't check that what kind of input function is getting you know so when you run and instead by mistake on function calls somewhere you actually uh, uh, you know call function with string then at runtime it's gonna crash it's gonna give you exception which is hard to catch why because your now your application is running on so many devices or your application is running under so so much load and it's crashing again and again and again and you know you have to just fix it right it's sort of like critical so what Kotlin came up with, um, uh, sorry, it doesn't, it didn't came up with, it, it was already there, it's there in a lot of programming languages and uh, that's why even if you are, if you guys are doing, I recommend uh, programming in, you know, statically type languages. So what does that mean? So what happens is, uh, in Kotlin, uh, everything is a type okay so for example if you are uh, building some sort of uh, student database right so one student is a type inside inside of that student you can actually add uh, you know uh, properties like student name um, student uh, surname student address roll number you know all those kind of things right but it is packed in one type so now for example if you want to get lot of students right or uh, array of student you are getting right you have to specify in that particular function that I want specific array of student I'm expecting output as array of students or I'm expecting input as array of students so by mistake if while calling that function if you are putting um, array of strings or array of some other type other than student it's gonna throw error at compile time okay so you won't be able to compile your program so you will know where you made mistake and you can actually figure it out at compile time so while the program runs 
you don't have to go through all those crashes and believe me around 50% of the errors easily will be you know removed by just using statically typed languages other important thing about kotlin is it's a multi platform means you can actually write the code once and run it on uh, so many platforms uh, major of the majority of the platforms are uh, linux macos or uh, windows per se why because kotlin is uh, jvm based language you know and not just kotlin all the jvm based languages or other virtual uh, environment you know uh, vm vm based languages they are generally multi platform so this is not kind of a big deal to be honest now kotlin has a uh, you know mixed paradigms uh, it supports functional uh, really good support for functional programming as well as it also has um, object oriented support because jvm is kind of you know uh, the thing uh, of object oriented programming languages right so yes uh, but yes if you are interested you can write functional programming and i suggest you guys should you know read out on functional programming also it's, it's kind of really good thing okay now uh, again you know you might be like uh, why am i learning a new language or why even i need to use kotlin you know per se uh, because uh, you already have java you already have scala and you know closure and um, groovy and so many jvm based languages right which are really good nothing against them then you might be thinking why the hell i'm you know i even learning kotlin at the first place why should i need to learn new language so okay before I go through the specific features I just want to say learning programming language if you are a software developer is a good thing first of all it'll give you a different way of looking at things uh, you know from other per others perspective I, uh, and um, which will result in uh, you know writing way more improved code even if you are you not using kotlin and you are using some other languages right you will get some fundamental ideas you know that for how kotlin is differ from a differ or some speciality things that kotlin has so uh, that's a general advice uh, uh but let's go through you know um what are the specific feature in kotlin that is making it so much interesting and community is picking up very fast especially android community so one thing is it's concise okay so uh, what does it mean so concise mean you know kotlin is going to be like uh, when you write kotlin that right, you are not writing any boilerplates uh, if you are, if you have done some java then you might know that you know creating new class and new factory methods and lot of you know those kind of things again and again and again it's just frustrating you know it's really good at start but after some time it just gets uh, you know uh, very boring and you are just writing supporting and factory methods and not doing the actual thing that the program supposed to do so what kotlin came up with uh, is uh, you know you don't have to do any of those you can just literally write the functions and it will return the output and you are good to go that's it other thing it's safe so kotlin is one of the f uh, really fine feature that I'm, i i kind of you know got really attached to it's called null safety so one of the author uh, or you can say really good programmer told once you know that uh, null pointers are a billion dollar mistake if you see i can tell you in the whole software industry more than 50% of the error or the crashes are happening just because of the null pointer exceptions you know and that's like really big of a deal so kotlin thought you know you know with those nulls let's get rid of those once at a time you know once and for all so what happened is they came up with something called null pointer uh, safety now what happens is when you are passing some sort of value right and uh, right and it's null and you are not expecting null say at the compile time kotlin will give you an error saying that this value might be a null you know so you can actually figure it out that it should not be null uh, i mean it's uh, kind of optional you can actually avoid those kind of checks at compile time if you want because android is still you know a lot of code base in java right so you might have to support those kind of things but if yeah if you are writing a strict kotlin i suggest you go with that and promise i can promise you that you guys are solving more than 50% of the bugs 
just you know by on the first successful compilation that's that's how it works i mean it's really good okay one of the other thing it's totally interoperable with java so you can just write kotlin today <coughs> Now the thing with new programming language is you know you have to rewrite all the libraries and all the big code base that you have and it's kind of gets boring you know after some time because you have done the whole job like like the whole year right and you have to rewrite it's it's, it's kind of boring you know so kotlin thought uh kotlin people thought you know at jetbrains uh that why don't we you know just i mean make it interoperable uh, of course it turns on jvm so it's just not kotlin even Scala and Clojures and Groovy and those uh, languages are also kind of interoperable. So this is, you cannot say it's kind of big deal, but yes. If you're writing an Android and you want to adapt Kotlin in your code base and you have a lot of Java code, right? You don't have to worry. You can literally write Kotlin today. You can call all the Java classes and all the Java methods without any runtime overhead. Amazing thing. Trust me. Okay. Now, why I didn't use Java that much because of the tools, you know, Maven and these and that, and those things are really good, but kind of complex, you know, and not that much documentation around it. If it is, it's not kind of like, you know, beginner friendly or user friendly, developer friendly kind of thing. So Kotlin is a really good tools. Why you say? Because it's built by one of the best tooling company, JetBrains. If you guys if you guys are using IntelliJ IDEA or Android Studio, you can say what the company does, right? That's all created by JetBrains and the same company created Kotlin. So you will be expecting best of industry tools while you're doing the Kotlin. So you don't have to worry about that because trust me, one of the things why languages fail is because of the tooling. Tooling is really important. For example, you need to have a package manager, dependency manager, uh, manager, you know, project manager, and all those kind of things, you know, to automate uh, dependencies, all those kind of tasks. I mean, nobody's got time, right? I mean, doing all these things manually again and again and again. So yeah, I mean, that's what Kotlin provides. Now, what you can do with Kotlin? Well, these are some of the applications that I thought I should I should just you know list it out so you guys can have idea what you want to write or what you can write it with Kotlin. So you can have your scope, you know. So uh, you can figure it out from the first video only that Kotlin is right for you or not. I mean, these are just uh, you know higher level examples. You can do a lot of extra things that I might not even be aware about. You know, crazy world. So yeah, so first thing you can actually write uh, all the applications with on run, which runs on JVM, which is like majority of the applications you can write. Uh, of course, they have a support for browser. So what Kotlin does is if you are using um, uh, Kotlin and you can actually write a lot of code and you can actually compile it to JavaScript, you know, which will run on browser. So it's amazing. You know, you can write statically type language, compile everything and just, you know, push it to JavaScript and it should run brilliant i think it's a brilliant idea <coughs> of course you can write native applications using kotlin so what happens is you know for some kind of applications using jvm it's kind of battle battle like you know that you don't want to use jvm because it's kind of resource consuming and all those kind of things for android applications or server and everything it's fine but if you're running on embedded devices or devices where you have very limited amount of ram and you don't want to waste on jvm Kotlin is coming up with something called Kotlin native, which is going to compile to native binaries. So you can directly run without any kind of JVM. And I think it's a brilliant idea. I mean, you have better alternatives, you know, I don't want you guys to like mislead you towards Kotlin. You can actually, if you are doing the model, uh, modern, um, you know, development, uh, on system pro systems programming, there is a really beautiful language called Rust is already making its way up to the top when it comes to you know doing the native uh, embedded or sort of like you know uh, development without any kind of runtime or without any kind of garbage collection that's and get C C++ level performance with lot of lots and lots of added features you guys should uh, check it out instead of using Kotlin native and it's not even stable yet it's just 0.5 at the time of recording you know so it might take a while to just reach to that stability level and Kotlin has a garbage collector I think uh, even while doing the native uh, 
development so it's kind of you know gray area and i'm not pretty sure about it but yes uh if you're using when the jvm comes i can guarantee you kotlin is one of the best okay other things you can do is you can write apis and you know server side programming uh which is like common uh when you're using java right so you don't have to use java anymore you can write apis there are uh really good libraries available right now you can just use it and be done with it you know it's it's a fun yeah okay so a couple of guys you know they started porting a lot of data science related tools into kotlin i mean that's one of the interesting area i was not expecting that because you know the python is uh, like leading when it comes to data science and everything but kotlin is making its mark i mean beautiful and of course almost anything that you can think of that you can write and run uh, anywhere where the jvm runs you can actually do that okay now one of the burning questions that i get you know okay it's fine and everything is good with kotlin but who's using it well you have the list these are the top companies who are using kotlin other than that there are thousands of com companies you know small startups and everything they're using kotlin to just push their android development you know because it's runs on android right so the the, the, you know accept acceptability is really high i mean kotlin pick up like anything if you see github you know a lot of repositories if you see uh the top 10 languages top 20 languages kotlin is actually pushing very fast so yeah i'll just going to say it anyway google amazon netflix you know pinterest uber uses to you know do a lot of animations on uh, android uh, application foursquare trello you know coursera and jet prince of course base camp so all these companies right? these are one of the top companies who you do use a lot of kotlin a more major of them are using for um, of course android development and some sort of mobile development and i think amazon is using for uh, server side development there are companies who are using for server side as well as a data science uh but you know there are like kind of like startups and everything but you don't have to worry about anything you can literally use server side kotlin today android today with all the support literally out of the box because it's interoperable with java okay so you know this is uh before we start i just want to tell you that this is going to be the last slideshow presentation that i'm going to give all other uh, all other um, you know tutorials are gonna be based on code only so you don't have to worry about that i'm going to write a lot of code and you guys will be just keep watching and keep learning this i will uh, this i will uh, i want to do okay now other thing is uh, you can just follow me on twitter you know this is my twitter handle 00001 and you can provide me feedback about this course or all the other courses that i'm putting or if you have any questions if you have any um, you know some things that you want to talk about if you have any some problem that you want to talk to about, talk to about you know to me you can just write me on twitter you know we can have a chat and uh, i will try my best to you know solve if you have any issue or problem i'll try my best to solve every uh, any of it um, you can also write uh, me on uh, you know this um, message as a send me as a message i wouldn't mind uh, so let's get started i guess hello guys my name is vijay and this is the tutorial everybody was waiting for i mean that's what i can tell you why because it is time to install some kotlin well kind of bad news for you guys why because i'm not going to install kotlin manually on my computer why because let me tell you one thing kotlin lang has great 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 resource on how to install kotlin on your computer and uh, there are like plenty of ways you can actually install kotlin based on your use cases i thought you know i'll just show you i'll read out you to that page and you guys will be good to go now if you are okay let's get started you know uh, enough uh, with this all kotlin like the doors and stuff so okay first of all you have to go to the official website of the kotlin lang which is kotlinlang.org okay then you just uh, you will see this page or with time it might get changed but it won't change that much 
So there is a section called uh, Try Kotlin. Try Kotlin is actually a documentation on how to install Kotlin. Okay. So one of the things is if you are you just want to try it, try it out Kotlin, you know how syntax looks, how it feels, and all those kind of things. You know you don't even have to install the Kotlin. So they have a called try dot Kotlin link dot org, which is a try online. Let's just open this link and see how it works. So this is kind of like online, uh, you know, editor and compiler and everything. So you don't have to do anything. So we have two functions, sum and you know, main function, of course. You can just run and get a feeling the sum is three, right? So you don't have to actually install or do anything. You can just, you know, play around with Kotlin online using try dot Kotlin lang dot org. That's it. But if you are doing Kotlin for a while and if you if you are serious about you know using Kotlin Lang, then what you should do is you should install onto your local environment because there'll be a time when your internet will be a little bit slow or you don't want to use online it because there's a lot of restrictions, right? When you're doing online because you cannot you know create a big projects and those kind of things and they are not kind of safe and everything but you know just let's not talk about those and just see how you can install Kotlin so first of all is IntelliJ idea I think this is one of the best way to use Kotlin um, I mean as they say because when you download IntelliJ idea right uh, when you download IntelliJ idea it'll come it'll come with Java and Kotlin pre-installed and everything you know it'll take care of everything you don't have to do anything okay so what do you do? You download IntelliJ IDEA. Uh, let me just search. Sorry for the spelling if it's wrong. Yeah. So this is like uh, one of the trademark prod uh, products of uh, JetBrains and don't worry about it, you know. It is uh, free as well as paid version. So they have a community edition, really good. See, you can just see the feeling, you know, it's the best. Uh, so what happens is they have a community edition, okay? so. You can literally download uh, the community edition which is free for lifetime you don't have to pay anything it's totally open source and totally free so you can just go and download it and they have a kotlin support for that here is are the details of what um, the community edition supports and what ultimate which is a paid version if you want you can take it you know uh, no big deal uh, so yeah it's open source license community you will get a full-on uh, java kotlin groovy scala support which is i think wow that's really good and uh, you have android support you have maven griddle you know spt all those kind of package manager and project manager uh, tool support you will have git and all those version control system support and these are the advanced feature if you are kind of you know uh, doing and if you are interested in doing you can, you can actually buy it out ultimate it's uh, no big deal of course for ultimate version also they have like 30 days trial so you can just check it out and of course this is not a you know sponsored pr presentation or anything i feel this is a best way to uh, do kotlin or java so i just told you guys don't work. so that was uh, the IntelliJ. once you download right this is how you can set up the environment you know uh, you can just go here sdk is kotlin java because kotlin javascript will compile to javascript right so you want to set up in the kotlin uh, java and then you actually create a new project called hello world that they're saying and you just go to next yeah so this is your project structure uh there'll be a source file inside source file you can just keep writing you know all the app.kt and all those kind of uh, files for kotlin and that's it and you can literally just do you know right click and run appkt and it will run don't worry I'll, I'll go through all those things uh, when i'll create a project and we'll go through all the tutorials right so you don't have to worry about that this is just like the easiest way to install okay other thing is android studio so again if you're doing sort of android development that i don't even need to tell you you know how to install android studio and everything and if you're using android studio 3.0 or uh, later uh, uh you have a first class support for kotlin so whenever you are creating a kotlin um a pro you know android project you will be you know notified that okay you want to use kotlin or not there is a little bit of checkbox uh, so the thing is android is out of uh, the scope for this uh, uh course so i'm not going to go through that but yes of course if i will be coming up with any android courses with kotlin in future i'll put the link in the subscription uh, in the description sorry and uh, I will notify you guys, you know, if you guys are uh, uh, have joined my uh, channel or something. Uh, the other way to use Eclipse, uh, Eclipse is kind of, I think, I mean, 
I haven't used in a while so I'm not pretty sure about it uh, how it uh, you know works even or anybody using is uh, using it or not you know but this is yeah this is uh, how you do I think they have a plug-in kind of thing so you can just literally install and go through it but I don't think anybody I mean majority of the people are using IntelliJ tools only so Eclipse is kind of like you know a free uh, alternative to IntelliJ tools but I suggest you go because you have an IntelliJ free right so <laughs> why you want to go through all the trouble and everything you know with Eclipse though it's amazing uh used to be amazing product i used a lot when i started doing java so no big deal but yeah of course another thing is you can actually use it as a standalone compiler if you are kind of like geek and you want to you know like i don't know uh compile your own source code it's again it's very easy you know uh so you can install it with the sdk man sdk man is a way a good way to install all those you know uh environments for programming languages uh, you can also install manual so manual is like nothing you just download the whole compiler from git release and just put it in your bin path and just run it it's that easy or if you are on mac os you can just do brew update brew install kotlin this is what i did i mean come on right you don't want to use your mind you know for all those kind of installation stuff when you are beginner level of course when you go high level you might want to play around with the compiler and everything see at the end of the day compiler is again it's just a program you know that you want to run the way you run ls commands you know all sort of like linux commands it's compiler again it's a command so what you do you download binary for compiler and you put it on path right your environment path and you just run it that's it that's the whole purpose of it uh, of course mac ports are available that's it so these are the various way you can install for Linux. You have to, I think, download IntelliJ IDEA or manually you have to download the SDK from GitHub uh, page, you know, sorry, the compiler and tool chain for uh, GitHub. Uh, here you can see the zip, right? You unzip it, you will get a binary. You just put it on your bin folder or you put it somewhere else and you set up that path environment variable and you will be good to go. That's it. So... I think that's uh, about uh, it when you when it comes to installing the Kotlin. So from next tutorial, I think we'll get started with you know how to write Kotlin code and how to compile it and how to just you know be awesome with Kotlin. So please, guys, please again uh, uh, just go through the whole course. If you don't like some sort of thing, I gave you my twitter handle on um, the introduction tutorial please just write me back or give me some sort of feedback so i can improve on these things all i want to do is you know just create a really really good content for you guys to understand the programming languages and other sources and other you know <laughs> tools and everything yeah that's that's my whole thing i guess okay guys so see you on next tutorial Thank you very much. Hello guys, my name is Vijay and in this tutorial we are going to talk about how to get started with Kotlin. Okay, so we talk a lot about how to install and you know how the Kotlin is good and this and that. Let's get started, you know, let's get our hands dirty. So okay, so this is IntelliJ IDEA. You are not required to use IntelliJ IDEA at all honestly if I'll tell you that this is just for me just to be you know like for um, good usability this is just a community edition it's totally free if you want you can get it from IntelliJ um, IDEA official uh, website of JetBrains and uh, uh, yeah let's get started you know but it's again I told you right it's not uh, you know uh, literally uh, required at all okay so how you create a new file so it's a new kotlin file class main dot kati now remember one thing you know the extension is dot kati it's not dot java dot jvm or whatever okay that's it so it's in the source here main okay so now whenever you write any program in any programming language you know you need to have an entry point so kotlin also has entry point it's called main just like any other programming languages Let's do println hello world bang 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 okay as you can see this is all you require I told you right Kotlin is kind of like you know concise language means you only write which is whatever is required you know you write like very less amount of code to do a lot of work this is all it requires let's just compile it out I'll go to terminal 
okay i'm in the current uh, the home directory of my project now remember one thing you need uh, i'm not using this uh, feature of intellij because i want you guys to you know understand how the kotlin compiler works and how it packages application and everything it's very easy okay so to compile your kotlin uh, source files you need kotlin c okay you can just do help and figure it out lot of options that uh, are available with the kotlin c we are going to use some of those just couple of those not even some of those so let's compile our source file kotlin c our source source file is source main dot kt and uh, i'm just going to add uh, include runtime what this will do i'll tell you and d is out dot char now uh, this option you know uh, include runtime what it will do it will actually package your whole application into one standalone sort of like a java binary okay so d is for destination and uh, where you want to store all those executables in out dot char so this will actually include runtime will actually include um, all of your kotlin libra libraries and you will compile it down and it'll actually package everything so you don't have to worry about anything else let's just see how it works okay it's compiling it might take some time because it's compiling a lot of stuff uh but uh, no worry it won't take that much time like c or c plus plus so <laughs> be cool with that so now now if you see okay now you see we are out of jar right it's kind of like big size but it's okay you know size doesn't matter that much because it's an ex executable you know it's just like it's packaging everything and giving you one executable jar right now you run that just like you run any other jar file you know outdoor jar and boom hello world you have your application now one of the good advantages you can just send this outdoor jar to your server and if you have java installed on your server you can just run this command and it should work you don't need to recompile over there you know set up your environment variable and this and that and stuff like that so in that way kotlin is really good so, you know it's just that two command you run but this is you know uh, very easy right now because we just have one source file once we'll have so many source files you know our big project it it will be somehow hard to maintain those kind of things uh, or the compiling you know <laughs> like this easily so for that we might have to use some sort of like build tool or some sort of scripting or something like griddle or bazel well uh, currently that is out of the scope of this tutorial but if i am creating video tutorials for those things you know I will surely notify you so don't worry about that and uh, let's just focus on Kotlin for now okay so this is how you uh, compile your hello world let's talk about variables now I'm just going to delete this now in Kotlin uh, there are two ways you define the variables okay immutable and mutable now immutable means once you assign a value to your variable once you cannot reassign it remember that and let's create it well name string pj so this is how you create immutable variable okay because it's assigned one if you if i'll try to reassign it it won't work you can see there are well cannot be reassigned you understand right so this is how you create readable variables when where this can be useful okay when you are creating some sort of configurations or some sort of objects you know where you don't want this object to be modifiable once they are created okay at that time you uh, you can use this well keyword and you know uh assign them once and just read and uh, don't allow anyone to reassign them now what if but you know the whole purpose of the variable is to keep reassigning right that's how you want to use it we have a keyword for that it's called where where is for variable name string and vj now if you see if you are reassigning right it's not throwing in any error why because you can reassign it's reassignable mutable variable okay so this is uh these are the only two ways you can assign variable in kotlin it's that easy okay one more thing if you don't write this because kotlin has a automatic type type inference you don't need to write this but only whenever you are assigning your variable at the time of creating okay i'm just going to remove this okay so here this is valid but if you are like removing this and again you're doing something like you know this is not valid why because at the time of compilation kotlin will try to figure out what the 
type of this name variable is so at the time you need to explicitly tell kotlin that okay this is a string and i'm not assigning right now i'm going to assign it in near future so kotlin doesn't have to go you know figure it out by reading whole program because kotlin might not know that when when you are going to you know assign this variable so it'll just throw an error say just you know if you don't want to assign this variable then i cannot figure it out what type of this variable is so just you know please do you mind just putting the type here so i and you know make both of us uh life easier or something yeah so this is how we do that but yes of course if you are doing something like uh assigning variable at the time of creation that you don't need to type you know but i suggest you put type because that's that's the whole point of uh, writing a statically typed language right uh, one of the good thing if you if you maintain practice like this you know uh, putting type after variable is um, that if uh, you are working in a group right if some other someone other is you know trying to read your source code uh, that guy will figure it out okay the name is string you know and so after a couple of hundred li lines if you are assigning or if you are reassigning the value he will figure it out you know that okay he or she will figure it out that okay uh, this is a type string and this is how it should be handled you know so it's good practice to put the types uh, when at the time of creating your variables that's that's what i think but of course kotlin will give you freedom to put or not put the types so these are the ways you uh, create kotlin variables okay uh, so in next tutorial we are going to talk about how basic types works you know primitive types integer and boolean and double and everything else so let's uh stay tuned you know guys and please 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 if you have any issue or any suggestions regarding all this just uh you know tweet me up and uh i will get back to you as soon as possible thank you very much guys hey guys my name is vijay and welcome to the tutorial of basic types in kotlin so in previous tutorial we talked about you know how to get started with uh, kotlin and you know how to compile and all those kind of things in this video we are going to talk about uh, some primitive types in kotlin now before i uh, you know start programming and everything let me just tell you one thing everything in kotlin is the object of some class okay so the basic class like in java it's object right which is the base class of everything else in uh, kotlin any is actually a base class of anything so for example let's just say that i'm just going to create a main function i just say i want variable name which should be any and then you can literally define uh, literally uh, put any value inside of this uh, where it's name or this or i don't know 4.5 floating you know anything so this is like the base class on top of the all the class are built okay so the concept of interfaces and you know all those kind of things we will come in the future when it when it will come i'll tell you in detail and how uh, all this type system works in kotlin but for now you just need to remember that everything in the kotlin is an object of some type or some class okay so now uh, so uh, there are some special types uh, which kotlin has defined internally they are called primitive types you know so let's go through the primitive types so we have uh, five sets of primitive types uh, basically for numbers for characters for string sorry i just got put character string and boolean and some collection type basic is array okay array is basic so all other collection types like you know linked list or map hash map set all those collection types uh, will be coming in the separate dedicated video so don't worry about that let's go through the number okay so uh, so number uh, numbers are based on the size of the storage okay the memory that uh, it contains you know it occupies so let's just create a one variable very small 8 bit okay uh, it's called in kotlin byte is equal to one now byte is nothing but a number with eight bits okay so the i'm just going to write down size also eight bit 
so whenever you create any type any variable where the type is by it is going to occupy 8 bit in your ram so remember that um this is really important for example uh, so the range of this it can uh, so number if you want to store you can store 1 to 255 that's it so this is like the limitation okay something like that or if it's uh, uh, unsigned or signed then you can just do minus 127 to 127 128 something like that but uh, for simplicity I'm just giving you the size okay sorry and other type is uh, called short of type short which is again I'm just gonna 20 the size is 16 bits okay sorry for that so now what happens is what if you have some number that you don't want uh, you know above certain uh, range for example like 30 uh, 32,000 right then you can actually create short instead of some bigger type and you know save some space the third type is uh, I'm gonna call int which is int capital which is any number you know let's call it 100 now the size here is 32 bits now why the size matters you you seeing right for example now you need uh, some number you know which possible value is from 1 to uh, 255 then you don't need to specify int uh, that type as int you can specify as a byte and you can work with it why because it's gonna just take 8 bits in t instead of 32 bits so you are actually optimizing for 4x you know 4x size of your RAM this is how sort of like optimizations are done if you see right these are like the micro optimizations but these are really important when you have some large project and you know requires a lot of memories right another type is uh, long which is uh, uh, anything which size is 64 bits so this is like the maximum you will be going so if you have like very big number in billions or something then you can assign long and you can done be done with it so now okay now the by default uh, whenever you create a number for example if you do variable number okay of 300 right then it's it's going to create with int uh, okay so that's why if you see the error here right explicitly given type is redundant because by default whenever you uh, you know give a compiler and you know uh, a capacity to uh, or permission to you know define any type and you are not specifying any type it's going to go for the int which is 32 bits uh, okay in memory so if you want something uh, other than int and then you have to explicitly specify for example if you want like big number it uh, you have to explicitly specify that this is a long and I don't want int okay these are like the integer number types you know without any floating points now let's see how to create a float float is type float is equal to 3.4 now remember one thing if float is a 32 bit in size okay now it's showing error right why because it whenever you define or create a float in value you have to you know um, the uh, end it with F then only it will be considered as a float otherwise it will be considered as double which is or another and last type so as you can see now double is a very uh, it again it occupies you know 64 bits of space and this will occupy 32 bits of space so if you have a floating point number and you don't want to you know you want to optimize and you don't want to you know I mean like push a lot of memory then you can just create 3.4 F and it'll take care of your 30 I mean 32 bit you know will be taken care of so these are the uh, you know primitive number types uh, when it comes to Kotlin these are like the basic types you can create many sorry for that <coughs> uh, you can create many uh, composite types by merge and mix all these numbers and everything uh, not an issue we will be uh, going you know towards that and we'll be we'll be seeing how to create custom data types and everything so don't worry about that these are just a class okay they are not data types one thing to note in here is uh, 
uh, you know all those types are capitalized right so the first uh, letter is capital so you know this is like the standard way of doing in the Kotlin you have to capitalize your types and everything so whenever you're creating any class or anything you have to put a capital start with the capital this is uh, I think it's uh, forced into you so whenever you might be creating a class then you uh, might have to specify okay when the class tutorial will come we'll see more in detail don't worry about that but just remember that all the types are capitalized let's create a character type so we'll create a character character type so character type is defined by care is equal to R so this is our character type it's gonna occupy 8 or 16 bits based on if it's ANSI then it's gonna be like 16 bit I think all languages support ANSI so it's gonna be like 16 bit but it's ASCII coded then it's gonna be 8 bit okay so now uh, remember the character type in other languages if you see it's just a byte you know most of the time but here it is not a byte so you cannot just give some number and it's gonna work no you have to specify in the single uh, quotation you know that okay this is a character let's create a string uh, name string is equal to string is easy right in double quotation you just say my name is vj okay this is how you create string now let's create a boolean now booleans are very small types you know it's just true or false you might be knowing so true or false is a boolean i'm just gonna get true you can also give value false or something here again you see it's redundant right why because kotlin uh, knows that is can be boolean because it's a true or false right so it have to be uh, boolean only here string also they're saying it's redundant you don't need to write but i suggest you write it down see it looks really good plus you know the name is string now character is okay now you know uh, so these are all the types the last type is actually not type it's just it's sort of like you know a container for different different kind of types it's like a, a, a uh, but I consider it as, uh, as, a, as a, like a primitive types because you know you need to understand that uh, okay so let's see how array is defined so there are a few ways you can define but couple of ways I like to define array as uh, in, when it comes to Kotlin so one of the type is uh, there is an inbuilt function called array of that you can do okay let's see how it works so I'm just creating uh, array of items uh, the type is okay yeah so the basic sorry so the basic type is array okay and here you have to do this is a base of this is a kind of a generic uh, uh, type uh, we will be talking more about that but for now just remember that whenever you want to define an array uh, now remember array are of a single type right uh, you know a collection of single type or single values of some particular type so I'm just going to create array of integer okay is equal to array of then you just can give the value 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, whatever, right? So you can give them. This is how you create a type of array. Okay, so now uh, uh, these are like this is like the one way to do uh, array. Other way to do is you know other items is again array of integer is C is array construct you know so this is like construct where you specify the size in integer which is I just say 10 and you specify uh, closure functions you know where first argument is uh, uh, the index no, sorry the only argument is index and I into 2 I'm just going to specify this okay so now what is happening in here is uh, this is a kind of like closure function okay or lambda function that we will be talking about in future uh, tutorials don't worry about that just remember for now that here what it means in array construct is first variable is how many element you want in this array fix size okay and other is like uh, just you know like producing the variables uh, or those ten, uh, 10 elements so what happens is when you call this uh, when you create this right this function will be called number of times which is i the size okay and this is like the index i is here is the index so it will be called for a particular position and you can actually generate that particular uh, value for that position and let it push into that this is kind of a, like a functional programming paradigm you know I told you right when I started Kotlin is also kind of functional uh, also you know this is really important uh, we will be seeing these use cases and all the uh, you know 
uh, advantages of writing closures and all those kind of things in uh, future tutorials when we will be giving uh, closure a bit of you know like functional touch and everything uh, so for now we just have to remember this is a closure it's nothing it's a function it takes index as argument and whatever you are returning right it will actually push into that particular index okay now oops, sorry now what happening is okay now you might be like how to access the items it's simple where particular item is of type integer from item so like you can just write it down index you know from one giving this is one way to do or you can just call a get method on item and just specify that index and you will be getting it right how to set you know if you want to set some item items dot there is a function called set and you can just specify on first index I want to update this to 40 and it will update it okay so you don't have to worry about that and also you can do items dot one is equal to 40 it's a traditional way of doing it that will also work you don't have to worry about that but just make sure that this index this can throw an exception if uh, the size is like you know right now 10 and you just specify like 30 or uh, you know uh, 30 or 40 right this should not it will throw a runtime exception why because at compile time this Kotlin won't know what size you have specified you know so when you will run because it's 40 so it, it can throw an error uh, out of bound uh, area out of bound exception so make sure about that so this is how we do uh, array kind of thing okay uh, looping over array and all those kind of things i think maybe uh, so the next tutorial is uh, sorry uh, it will be about uh, you know uh, control uh, flow and everything and after that i'll be talking about a lot of looping related things at that time i might be telling you know how to loop through array and everything so don't worry about that so this was all uh, like you know a different different primitive types in kotlin so I think this is it you know you just need to remember this is really important you might be thinking why and you know this type no when you are whenever you are doing the optimizations you know or whenever you want to save some memory or something you know so just make sure that you <laughs> you have all these uh, types in mind so whenever you creating the variable you just don't waste unnecessary RAM or something why you know if you need just a byte and you are specifying long then it's like you are actually you know 64 bits instead of 8 bits you are actually okay allocating to that particular variable which is can be costly so <clears throat> yeah so this are all primitive types uh, uh, Okay guys, so I'll see you on the uh, next tutorial and we'll talk about control flows, you know, how if else work, how conditioning works and all those kind of things. So, thank you. Hello guys, this is VJ and in this video we are going to talk about comments. Well, first of all, why comments are useful? So, for example, you're writing a function, okay, that just go through all the products uh, from your product list and, uh, uh, you know, find some product uh, where uh, the price is, uh, you know, between some uh, predefined criteria that you have, right? Now, you are writing the function, okay? Uh, now, after that, you know, uh, the function uh, is used by your colleague. So how that guy will know, uh, you know, what parameters to pass and uh, how this function is going to react on certain parameters and which are required parameters and which are not required parameters. So what do you do? You actually write an explanation just about the function. Uh, so whenever the other guy, you know, in your team is reading that uh, code, he can or she can, you know, um, easily uh, understand what the function does uh, without, you know, going through whole code. I mean, if the function is small, then that's okay. But if the function or library is big, then I think it's kind of, you know, like a bit cumbersome to, you know, uh, uh, understand uh, in a minimum possible time. Uh, so for that, uh, you need to write some explanation. So to write that explanation, we use comments. Okay, so what do you do? Let me just see. It's very easy. Uh, and if you are doing the programming, then you might know how comment works, right? So I'm just going to, you know, just um, quickly just give you 
how comet works in Kotlin. So this is like for single line comments. Uh, this is comment. Okay, let's create another function. Uh, does nothing. Okay, so I created a fun which does nothing, doesn't take anything, doesn't return anything. So if, if I want to describe, I can do this function does nothing. That's it. So this is like one line comment. But what if you want to describe in bit detail, you know, so you can actually write multi line comments like this this function is actually a demo function it doesn't do sorry doesn't do anything at all now when it come when the kotlin will compile it it won't actually you know execute this because it's not code right? it's just yeah, it's pure, pure english you know so this is how comments in Kotlin works. Uh, <coughs> uh, Multi-line and single line. There are other kind of comments in Kotlin, I know, but those are for like writing documentation and everything. Uh, that is kind of like out of the scope. Uh, it, that is a bit of an advance. If I'll be doing some advanced, you know, videos, I'll definitely, you know, share with you guys. Don't worry. But this is all you need, you know, uh, when it comes to comments. Uh, okay then uh, so the next video we will be talking about control flow you know and how you do the conditioning and everything see you then guys <coughs> hello guys today in this video we are going to talk about control flow now why you need control flow well it's simple for conditioning you know if you want to choose this or that you know if you have something and if it's less than or greater than control flow is like everyday you know thing when you're writing programs right so kotlin uh, also has a control flow it's uh, there are just two ways you can do uh, you know control uh, uh, the you know flow of the program but both are like really powerful <coughs> now uh, let's see uh, first if okay so i'm going to create a function uh, that will give me a maximum value out of two value a is gonna be int b is gonna be int okay and this should written int okay uh, how to write functions and everything it's gonna be coming but it's very easy I think you guys can figure it out uh, this is how you write function okay so I'm going to explain if else <coughs> so it's very easy it just like see you know if a is uh, greater than b then i would like to return uh, a because a is greater than uh, the max okay else if uh, a is, l is equal is equal to b so in this kind of condition you can return anything but i'll just return a again else just return b because b is supposed to be b uh, sorry <laughs> a maximum yeah, so this is how you do the control flow. This is way of doing if else, okay? <coughs> but one of the really uh, exciting and good thing about this is uh, this is actually an expression, okay? So you can actually store whatever if else is written in some variable. So for example, we can create a variable answer is equal to uh, something like this, okay? And you don't need to write return. Uh, here or here or here so what happened what's happening in here is if a is greater than b then this whole block which is called expression okay so in any programming language there are statements and there are expressions so now all the expressions they return some single value remember that in Kotlin it's really really uh, useful to write this kind of expression for example if you are doing some sort of state management everything right you don't need to maintain that state inside if else you know you don't need to create that variable outside that's true or false or something right you can just return out of all this if else block and you'll get that answer and you can just you know return that answer that's it so you have to just write it in once you know instead of writing again and again and again and it's totally independent of everything else okay let's just create main function let's see if it runs or not otherwise you guys will be thinking come on it's not even possible let's see okay so I'm just going to create variable 
a is of type integer is equal to 3 and variable b is of integer of 5 the output should be print ln the max value is let's see boom boom that is going to be like where max is going to be integer sorry integer is equal to give me max out of a and b right it's that easy let's see uh string interpolation we'll be doing max that's it right let's see how it compiles and see how it works so i'm just going to go to terminal you know useful <coughs> uh -oh. yeah see i'm gonna do boom let's compile and see how it works uh it's compiling okay it compile chawa boom the max value is five why because as you can see it's supposed to be five is the max so this is how if and else works and uh, okay so now let's talk about uh, you know one other uh, uh, control flow uh, technique it's called when so you might if you have, if you have any previous experience you might have known about you know um, a thing called switch statements right <coughs> so uh, sorry for that uh, switch statements are like you know if if you have like so many values right instead of writing you know if else if else if else if else if else what do you do you just write switch and define all the cases and based on that you do some sort of uh, uh, progression right so let's just write again uh, this is gonna be okay give me a uh, print out the value okay whatever you're writing so I'm just going to do print number uh, function it'll take a uh, number of type int as input and it's gonna give us nothing it's, there will be no output <coughs> it's just going to print it out okay now remember so number we a uh, number can be anything right so if you write right anything like if else if else if else if else if else you know it's gonna be like infinite you know and it, that just i don't know that sucks so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to do when uh number is zero then i'm going to print uh, number is zero it's that easy right uh okay now when it's one i'm just going to print ln number is one now for any other case i don't wanna i don't care you know uh, i just you know everything else i'm just gonna say number is number is everything else well as you can see now i'm actually you know uh what do you call i'm controlling like all possible cases so this is kind of like a pure function a function without side effects you know you can actually enter any number if it's zero or one then it's gonna be like okay it's a zero or one it's the number of anything else let's just check it out okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to just delete these lines and i'm just going to call this function uh point number number with a right so it should print actually number is anything else everything else sorry sorry for that Call in C. We are compiling. It might take a while. Don't worry. Take a couple of seconds. Running number is everything else, right? And let's see if I'll run it with one. It should say you need to compile. Remember this. You cannot just keep running. Okay, this is not PHP. Though I love PHP, I don't have anything against it. It's in okay. Number is one, right? As you can see. So this is how it works. And again, this is also a expression so what you can do is variable answer you can just do something like this and instead of this you can just uh, return some sort of string you know it's a zero okay so this is how you return actually when you're writing an expression you can say one mm, a for anything else it's gonna be uh, other I'll just write other okay then what you can do you can just print that okay the answer is okay 
and so as you can see it's very easy right you can separate it out a lot of things so all the logic will go here it'll return some value and then based on that answer you can process something and again you return something right it's but remember all the expressions should return one value and one value only you know it can be any type don't worry about that but it should be one so for example if some big uh, student data to return right from expression you have to create that particular class and then you have to return a number is one the answer is one right because uh, we have given the one so as you can see it's very easy it's just not that you can actually uh, with when you can do a lot of things so if it's between 1 to 10 so you can actually write this kind of ranges and you know uh, okay so if this is in uh, 1 to 10 right or if it's in in like you know 11 to I don't know sorry uh, 11 to 1000 you can do something you know uh, between 1 to 10 then I can do between uh, 11 to 1000 and everything else now okay let's just I'm just going to pay, uh, put 11 right and let's see how it works Ah, see it's between 11 to 1000 so as you can see you can actually provide range remember you can actually provide anything in here that returns a single value okay let's uh, just for the satisfaction let's write a function you can I think uh, call functions also I'll just say you know uh, get well which will be well will be you no know, shit you cannot write value I can write and that return integer okay mm, I'm just going to uh, Printer print ln. I'm just going to say call this function just for the fun, you know, because I don't have any use cases right now, and I'm just going to return uh, value. That's it, right? And let's see if uh, we can get uh, uh, that call. So I'm just going to get get well. Uh, okay, it won't work like this. But you can actually put num in here. That should work. Yeah, you because this is you know it's the same scope, right? It's inside scope. Let's see how it works. If it doesn't work, then I have to apologize. You know, but I was just I was just expecting uh, because it's an expression, right? If you see generally, you know, based on theory, it should work. Okay, call this function. See, it is working, dude. Yes. So this you know this space this I mean this is really good man this is like you know what you can do is you know you can write some expression with uh, when on based on some particular input you can actually go call, call this out and you know you can do so many things it's, it's amazing I know it's see if you see Kotlin right they just have if and when but you can use it in crazy crazy ways you know so this was all control uh, flow guys you just go this is a beginner level introduction you can do lot of lots and lots of things as I told you right these are these are like you know function that return a single value uh, with the same type you know uh, that uh, the input it is right okay so you can I think uh, the, the possibilities are endless you know because it's an expression based thing it's not statement based thing you know so the possibilities are really really uh, uh, <laughs> the thing that you can think of but yeah one thing I can assure you with this is your code management will be really good uh, and you are writing actually kind of pure functions because you are actually if you see this function right I, I, I am actually um, going through all the possible cases you know so this function is never going to crash it's going to actually return something you know if if it cannot find anything else then it's going to read uh, written other you know for uh, all the other possible scenario or other possible inputs so this is kind of like pure functions and this kind of function they don't crash you know you need to write this kind of functions uh, uh, to make sure that your applications or uh, anything that you're building doesn't crash okay guys on next tutorial next video we are going to talk about loops I'm pretty sure you guys will be really interested in some sort of looping okay then hello guys this is we and we're gonna talk about today ranges so what is ranges a range in general so when you say range right uh, you're talking about you know 1 to 10 or I don't know give me something between you know 100 to 200 or give me something between 1 2000 you know something like that right that's called ranges uh, 
so if you in, in a traditional way if you want to do right how are you gonna do so actually uh, uh, you do something like let's just say uh, main and then you do if you want to create a range then you do where range is gonna be because range is essentially an array of items right if you do array of integer 1,2,3,4,5,6,7,8,9,10 so okay so this is how you define range you know if someone say hey give me something between 1 to 10 so well, you define this and then you loop over this right this is good uh, but you, uh, well, when you have you know like um, like small amount of uh, item to go through or uh, you know small amount of range to go through what if you have a range of 1 to 1000 I don't think you will be able to write that. I mean, you will be able to write technically, but it will be like a, a honestly mess. So Kotlin has a answer for you <laughs> for that uh, problem. Okay, so how you do that? So instead of this, uh, and of course, range is not an array actually, so they have its own type. So I'm just gonna use the type inference. Range is equal to one. 10 well as you can see here let me check which type it is range of and here okay sorry okay so we have an int range in here nice just gonna remove this so as you can see we created an int range right okay mm, now if you if someone will tell you that you know just make it thousand you can just do thousand and it will be as same as you can actually iterate over through so how you gonna iterate over to uh, right so for that we're gonna use for a uh, looping don't worry I will be taking uh, after this uh, for uh, item in range print ln item right simple so you'll get thousands so let's just compile it down and you know see as you can see it printed thousands right so see it, it, it's like this easy you know how to do this now they have uh, Kotlin has a functionality called uh, you know uh, range functions so what do you mean when I say range functions okay so let's just go through a couple of range functions so in is a range function okay so in will actually get one element out of this and it'll put it in the item and it'll actually give it to you here by the way you can here also put something like int or something uh, if you are if you want to go with the type you know don't worry see this is that easy uh, okay now uh, what if uh, you want to go on a reverse order okay so can you do something like thousand to one uh, let's see because I want you guys to see this thing uh, because reverse order is actually kind of important you know on few cases I'm not sure what case is but see it's not printing anything right why because you cannot define reverse and range like this range is always going from you know uh, minimum to maximum okay so this is what the minimum and this is what the maximum is and both are included so this is like if you know some sort of array thing this is like one to thousand okay so it'll print one and it'll print thousand also both are included okay so you want to go in a reverse order right so instead of this uh, what you do you do down to sorry uh, in a thousand down to one okay so this is not valid uh, or I'll just control exit just put it in the right place okay uh, reverse range is 
in range okay that's it ah sorry this is kind of like progression well it's part of range only don't worry about the type I'm just writing down so you have a better idea you know so this is a range but it's kind of like progression so what happens is making progress it's a function okay uh, sorry range uh, range functions they are calling it okay and in range reverse sorry I just reverse range no yeah okay there you go now I'm just too dependent on autocomplete right now so <laughs> don't worry about that just see if it's work or not oh yeah you know that way don't worry about that oh yes as you can see it's printing in reverse order so this is how you can create a reverse range with the progression okay it's it's a range only but with some extra added you know functionality okay let's talk about something else let's talk about some other uh, progression okay so I'm just gonna be variable step step progression okay now what does that mean it's again an integer progression so okay now we have a thousand to uh, sorry one two thousand right but what if you want to actually uh, you know uh, jump a few steps instead of just so currently if you see right it's printing one 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 two three four five why because it is you know jumping one step at a time but what if you want to actually go through five step at a time right we have that functionality so we'll do one we'll create a range then we'll create step five okay so uh, just go through this range so one to thousand but jump five step at a time you know so let's just see how it works and I'm just going to put here step step progression let's compare and see so it should print uh, 5 10 11 sorry 5 10 15 20 something like that 10,000 don't worry about the warning yeah you can see nice see 906 9011 so it's jumping five steps it's actually including so if you if you do from zero right uh, then it will uh, give you that you know 510 because it actually uh, jumps five steps after printing the first so 1 plus 5 is 6 right something like that well as you can see 930 935 40 right so this is how step uh, progression works uh, okay uh, now uh, if you want uh, it is similar to first only it's called until uh, progression until progression is again in progression it's called uh, from start from one until uh, thousand right so it is like this uh, you know but it's gonna exclude a uh, thousand I guess uh, so let's just see until progression of yeah. nice sorry for this kind of mess guys let's just go through it you know <laughs> I'm not going to edit all these mistakes why because I want you guys to know that this kind of mistakes can happen you know uh, it's not they're not deliberate I'm making it of course but it's you know for good good only right <laughs> okay so here you can see until thousand right so thousand is not printing because that is excluded so the only difference between the f all ranges and uh, until progression is these guys are one two nine 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 sorry thousand but the last element is excluded so this is how it works okay and other thing is we can actually mix and merge those ranges let's just create a mixed range mixed progression I'm just gonna call it it's gonna be again in, in progression okay and what you wanna create okay so I will go thousand down to uh, one 
every time i'll do i'll just take 10 steps sorry uh, 100 steps so it's gonna be just 10 printings and uh, let's compile it down let's run it down ah as you can see oops oh sorry i didn't print that okay let's run it guys this is the last progression for beginning level of ranges as you can see 1900 it, right so you can actually mix and merge a lot of ranges this is really good features when you have to loop through and you know do this kind of shortcuts and everything uh, okay guys so this was it from for ranges for now there are a lot of things you can do you can implement your own ranges and everything uh, you have to go through documentation it's kind of like advanced don't worry i'll be putting in uh, maybe later sessions uh, okay next today we'll talk about loops i think my favorite not that much though <laughs> thank you very much hello guys this is v and in this video we are going to talk about loops so i i mean there are like i don't know i mean with uh, with you know the price of stream there are so many ways you can actually do the looping and stuff but i'm going to talk about four basic pure loops that you can do in kotlin okay so a majority of the loop will be you know included in this uh, so don't worry about that these four loops are only you will require on uh, all the necessary situations okay so first thing i'm going to talk about is for loop you know your own old for loop but a little bit of modernized so instead of that you know four i is equal to zero and then you need to do put condition and you need to do you know the increment operator and stuff like that uh, now we have something called for in loops okay uh, so let's create an array first of all for, for example you have an array of uh, people right uh, which is a array of string and you want to loop uh, sorry let me just create array of string okay and I'm just gonna be like a I know this is like lame way of doing but forget it just think of this a b c d s people okay now you want to actually go through these people okay you have to loop through is these people so what do you do for uh person in people see the ergonomics right it's so easy i mean you can just you know literally like you're talking in english person in people you know print ln uh, person that's it let's see how it works Kotlin, I'm compiling. Hopefully, no error. <laughs> of course, not. It's five line of code, dude. Okay, A B C D, as you can see, right? So this is how you can actually loop through all kind of arrays. Okay, uh, so if you want to specify a type, you can just specify a type in here, saying that okay, this person is has supposed to be string type. If it's, uh, for example, if you have some complicated class, right, you can actually put it here. And if it's not belong to this. This, this the compiler is going to throw an error so this is a good way as i told you you know in a, almost every lecture just keep putting type whenever possible okay so this is like one way to do and other thing is we can actually loop through ranges also as i told you in last lecture uh or tutorial oh. uh, okay we'll create range of type int range is equal to one dot dot you know sorry i'm just gonna be like 10 only but you can do whatever you want okay so in that case it's gonna be integer uh, item item is gonna be integer from range okay so you cannot print this I'm just going to print item sorry okay Kotlin see I'm doing compiling and warning yeah because I'm not using don't worry about that warning Java char one two three four okay so here you go right you can actually go through ranges you know this kind of thing okay now let's go uh, uh, to another loop called while loop well while you might have heard about it right no big deal okay I don't think we will need this error so I'm just going to delete it okay I'm just gonna be okay so how you might be thinking how you create infinite loop right <laughs> while true 
just keep doing so this is how you create infinite loop in uh, kotlin you know after that anything you p put right uh, it's gonna be considered as a not reachable so if you go here right it's, it'll be like unreachable code why because this loop never is going to never going to exit it's a for loop unless you delete your program there are no conditions okay so let's put in condition here uh, where uh, i don't know condition of type int is equal to zero okay if condition is when condition reaches greater than 10 I would like I would like to break this loop so it'll 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 finish when the condition will greater than zero. So at the end of this loop we are going to do condition plus plus. And we are going to print the condition, okay? Let's see. So this is how you can like conditionalize your loops and stuff like that. You know, you when you have to go through a lot of uh, unexpected or very dynamic loops okay it's not printing at all it's zero well I told them to print the condition dude what happened anybody's got any idea what happened no condition is zero and condition well condition is oh sorry well so yeah so this is how it works this should be true this shouldn't be false then not a little work sorry for that so while condition is less than zero let's just doing you know while condition is less than zero so I actually kinda did unless kinda thing if they have unless thing then yeah there you go sorry for that but I think you got the idea right let's see if they have unless No, they don't have unless. <laughs> I thought because few languages that I learned they had elixir or something they had unless. So this is how you create a while while loop, okay? Uh, gotcha. Okay, now the third loop is a do while loop. It's the same thing, but you do and it's a while thing, okay? You can also create sort of like infinite loop here also. So it'll keep doing this thing, okay? whatever you are uh, allowing to print in here uh, infinite types no big deal the same thing it'll just but it will initialize first and then it'll check for the condition okay it, uh, instead of checking the condition first and initializing it's like you know other way around that's a no big deal so third kind of loop that I want to talk about which is kind of interesting is repeat loop okay so what repeat does is repeat okay you want to repeat some code okay so it'll be like okay repeat times 10 okay that's it right uh so you are specifying you know so instead of writing for in range and all those kind of things you just want to repeat something you know some amount of time you know so it's that easy right i'm just going to do print ln and i want to print 10 times hello guys something like that i know it's lame but well that if that works that's okay okay i'm compiling compile hello guys hello guys hello guys right so this kind of situation uh, may be you know useful when you are doing some sort of data processing and you know uh, you might want to process data uh, and repeat some amount of time or something like that you know use cases are definitely humongous for all these loops well if you are doing programming you might have been aware about those use cases with the loops and everything so this was guys a uh, basic introduction to loops you uh, you guys can just you know jump into the documentation website and just go through whole lot of details you know about loops and how you can actually make your data types loopable and you know rangeable and all those kind of things I mean it's really interesting you know uh, okay uh, but this is kind of like for beginner level people you know so if you are interested in more just go through the documentation or tweet me you know I gave you a handle on my beginning videos just tweet me and I'll um, just tell me that you want in detail and I will actually create a separate video for you and I'll put it on YouTube and I'll uh, send the link so you can learn more about loops not just loops you know about all kind of things you know if you think that you want to learn more go very much in detail just tweet me up and i'll actually reply you as soon as possible 
and of course i will create a content for you don't worry about that so thank you very much guys see you on a next video hello guys my name is vj and in this tutorial we are going to talk about functions we are going to talk about all kinds of functions you know i'm pretty sure that you guys might be wondering you know when the functions are coming because kotlin supposed to be kind of like functional language in you know uh, all stuff like that and i just talked about variables and you know comments and all those kind of loops and control and stuff like that okay so let's get started and let's just get a little bit real with the functions i guess so what is function uh, well this is a beginner level course so i just want to go a little bit deep in that so for example if you're creating a five instruction right and you're just putting here and there that will be you know not that organized and you might have to if you want to use it again you might have to write it again all those five instructions or something like that so what do you do you actually group together those things into one code block right that is function it's that easy you know <clears throat> So a function is nothing, it's just a group of statements that you guys are, you know, you want to execute and you want to reuse again and again and again in different places. That's it. And you are just giving that name to that thing. Okay. That's the function. So for example, in the Kotlin uh, main, so this is a main function. Okay. This is like entry point, uh, as I told you, you know, uh, when the program starts. So how you define a function? Okay. Let's see in Kotlin. So it's easy. It's fun. So uh, yeah, it's literally fun. So when you define a function, you have to define with the keyword fun and the name of function. Okay, and then uh, parameters. Uh, for example, in here, parameter name is and the type. This is like Pascal case, you know. So you have to give like name, parameter name, or variable name and type. You can again give it uh, where or just read only you know this way also you can give and then you have to give written type if nothing then unit will be the nothing written type and something like this oh sorry <laughs> so in the case of function uh, this where or well won't be allowed uh, it is whatever it is from the upper whenever you are passing the uh, parameters actually so that is in the case when you are building classes and everything I apologize for that so remember that this is not allowed okay uh -oh. so I'm using like kind of like Veeam <coughs> extension with uh, uh, IntelliJ so it's, that's why it's kinda you know weird and sometimes I make mistakes in typing and everything so you see where right well see these things are not allowed so just be careful with that so you got the whole idea right all the functions and everything okay now how you can call this function so let's say this function is doing nothing just printing something hello world you can call function by the name of the function okay so the first thing is declaring function and then uh, function usage so name of the func that's it i'm just gonna put i don't know anything i can put because it's not doing anything about it right so oh sorry it's asking for int i should have write i should have write uh, string in here because name is supposed oops, sorry name is supposed to be string okay so here you go let's just compile and just check it out compiling already Uh, warning yeah hello world right so you can see it's calling the function so it with it's right now it's like this but you can actually literally do it you know like uh, control P something like this and it should take care of it now you can see how you define the function and how to call the functions right now let's talk about the function parameters okay so this is what name right this is actually it's called parameter function parameter okay so this is the name of the function and this is the keyword that we are using to create the function so the Kotlin compiler will know that this code block is a function regular function okay so here I have defined name I can put like age as integer you know and I can just uh, instead of just pronouncing the age of 
this guy is this much okay that's it and I'll just give name and a 26 yes that's my age not so old I guess and compiling right so you can see the age of this guy is this much so you created a function where you can print the age of this particular guy okay so now what if uh, I don't want to you know give the edge for example if you're writing some function let's write a function where we define a, a guy if it's like boy or man you know so we'll give a criteria sorry let's just not go with the that philosophy okay let's go with the philosophy which it's allowed to drink or not okay so I'll just create a fun if it's allowed to drink alcohol or not okay okay so I'll just create is allowed okay now this function will take uh, age as a parameter and name as a parameter okay and it'll written boolean that yes this guy is allowed or this guy is not allowed simple right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to check so I'm going to use if else yes if age is less than 21 then I'm gonna be sending returning false now this guy is not allowed to uh, drink any and I forgot these boxes yeah uh, drink else yes this guy can drink okay so here you go Mm. as you can see okay name I'm just going to print it out also uh, no we already have written statement actually so we don't need to print it out uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just call these functions now so I'm gonna be storing that you can actually store that value into some variables so I'll just say uh, is allowed of type pool boolean sorry for that okay and is equal to is I'm just going to call the function I'm gonna give name which and I'm 26 so let's say I'm allowed to drink or not I'm just gonna be like print Helen you know is allowed question mark it should be true right let's see but it's allowed true so you can see right how it works so what I did I actually created function when I put all the logic over there I just get whatever input is required and I'll just give the output you know so this is how you do written type okay uh, that okay you are returning some value and based on that value you can actually do another kind of things you know you can chain together a lot of things but that's like sort of like advanced topic to do I mean if you are just learning you know new to programming or new to Kotlin then this should make sense for you as a uh, functions okay now default argument so what if uh, age if I'm entering uh, age nothing right if I'm not giving any age or something like that and I want some default argument so I can actually write that okay I default argument is 10 okay so now what happens is I can just say okay this guy is allowed there will be a situation right now this doesn't matter that much but there will be a situation when you want to do that you know you don't want to pass around all the arguments for example if you are creating some sort of DB connections and all sort of things right so by d you want to have some sort of default arguments you know that password protected yes by default this should be the password by by default you know this should be the location from where I actually read the encryption keys and all those kind of things right so what happens right now you see I'm, so I'm just allowed to pass the name and it's, it'll still work right the function expect two arguments but I'm actually passing one and it should still work it is working why because now when you don't pass any age right it'll do uh, it'll take ages 10 but remember there is only one caveat in this that all the default arguments should be you know uh, at the end of the 
uh, function parameter list okay so for example if name is also default then it's okay but here name is a required argument you will always have to pass it because there is no default so you should actually go in that order to start with all the arguments which are required and there is no default uh, value for that and then just move it to uh, the other side okay so uh, you have to do like this this is called like positional uh, parameters you know but there are another way there is a way you can actually come up with you know come over this uh, limitation using named parameters okay so what if i just want to be like you know oh sorry mm, i want to do something like uh, okay something like this okay see it's throwing an error why because right now we are doing as a, as a pay, pay to, uh, sorry as a positional parameters okay so instead of that I can just uh, instead of just doing this what I can do is I can give like something like this and uh, this will work now see now it's not throwing error why because and this is one of the really good feature I think Kotlin provides it it provides you to you know there it's allowing you to do named parameters so it becomes very easy right you don't need to go through that positional order okay that the edge should be the only first and uh, you know um, name should be the second parameter stuff like that you can just say okay name is this and age is I don't know 32 or 30 right see and it's really really good I mean if someone is seeing your code right they can literally figure it out you know that okay these are the parameters you're passing and this I just love this feature and Kotlin you know honestly and if you are doing a lot of Kotlin programming you will get used to it and you will love it too I can <laughs> guarantee you that so this was a uh, name parameters uh, okay let's talk about the variable arguments okay now for our example you know there will be a situation uh, you know uh, when uh, you might want like uh, something like uh, variable arguments where you don't know how many arguments you will be getting right so let me just clean out this code uh, let's create a function uh, okay uh, where arg or I don't know uh, get uh, names function okay so now uh, you don't know the uh, amount of names that guy might give right okay so one solution is you can actually expect an array of num uh, names okay uh, or you can expect a variable arc so for example you can just say where both the situations gonna be same okay mm, okay I'm reading nothing so I'm just gonna be like unit easy right see so now what happens is uh, this names it's actually an array okay uh, so for example if you want to print who is uh, let's print out all the people who are there right uh, so we learn some loops and everything so for uh, name in names print align the name is I like to do a little bit of those okay it's easy right so now whatever number of amount of name you are getting now see it's not array remember that it is still uh, uh, you know so you can just be like okay VJ you can see that right and it's not throwing an error why because it's a variable argument simple you can give one argument you can give any number of arguments it's that I mean this is again if you are doing from JavaScript and name is VJ right you can just say uh, see right now I just did something like this right because it's, it's an area only you can just say AJ you can just say Salman you can uh, just say Amir these are Bollywood actors uh, not the first two uh, second two <laughs> so okay let's just try it out so what happens with this is uh, your function won't throw an error so if you are expecting some sort of variable amount of arguments you can actually create a where arg you have to just put where arg keyword in front of your whatever uh, uh, you know parameter that you define it will automatically become array of that particular type okay so this was like the basics of all the functions uh, in the next tutorial we'll be talking about uh, 
lambda expressions, anonymous functions, uh, closures, and higher order functions. So just stay tuned, guys, and thank you very much. And again, uh, please, if you have any issue or any trouble or something that you want out of as a tutorial, or you don't have time to learn, or you don't know how to learn, or uh, anything, you know, and you want me to present it to you, just tweet me or comment it okay anywhere you, you are seeing this video i would love to get your feedback and i will i will i promise you if something i can do i will do thank you hello guys <coughs> this is vijay and in this tutorial we are going to talk about uh, lambda expressions okay so what is lambda expressions well uh it is uh, sort of like a functional you know paradigm if you have been uh, if you have done some sort of functional programming that you might be knowing uh what lambda expression is but it's actually uh very easy uh what you do actually is uh you create a kind of anonymous function uh but uh, you don't have a return type okay so that whole lambda expressions it does uh perform all the things that the function perform it takes parameter as input you know it has body but it does not return instead of that it will just uh, pass you that one value so it is kind of like return uh, but it's uh, so as you know uh, the expressions right expressions always return a single value the same way lambda also return a single value okay let's just uh, check it out so i'm creating a lambda function first lambda functions i'm showing you the how to create a lambda in kotlin okay so where first lambda okay the type is uh, it'll take integer to integer and it'll uh, return another integer okay now you might be thinking then why you are writing that integer in here you know uh, uh, sorry uh, you might be thinking why you're writing like this so this is like the signature okay so what we just did here uh, see I'm not doing a uh, written type like this why because this is actually not in written type it is an expression that's why I'm putting that arrow in here so this is the type first lambda type that we created okay so this is you uh, this is nothing it's just a composite type we created a type uh, that uh, okay this is uh, this is called a lambda type in short so what happens in here is this is like a, uh, this is a kind of a lambda function which take uh, takes or function which takes two uh, parameters <coughs> as input and it'll return or just gives uh, input as uh, integer as output okay so let's create a body so when you create a body you need to create that body between these curly brackets okay and then what is the signature integer integer so you are passing two integer parameters integer a integer b you remember this is just like functions only and then you start writing body okay around this and how do you do uh, a plus b so uh, okay okay as you can see this is a wrong okay because you cannot create something like this because the type is just to return integer but we are returning uh what do you call yeah so this will in this case you might have to put written something like this no that should, that also doesn't work because you should not have written in uh, lambda right okay so here you go so this is like uh, the first lambda that we created okay so now sir you don't need to give this type you know uh, but just for the uh, purpose of understanding i just gave you those type and uh, nobody writes that but I, I you know honestly that would be best practice if you actually write it down because it's good documentation by itself you know so what happens is here this is taking two parameters and it's returning third integer right as output here as you can see so a plus b right so this is nothing it's a simple lambda okay and how you call this simple it's like uh, we're just calling the function first lambda two and three and it should give you five so i'm just going to print where uh 
result is equal to first lambda and I'm just going to print ln that thing um, the lamb lambda result sorry result is result let's just check it out boom see it's working right so what you actually did in here is you just created a lambda you don't need to actually go through creating functions and everything you know now one of the important thing about this is it can actually capture your external environment so this is a kind of like closure only you know so what happens is for example I say integer a sorry uh, variable uh, some integer a of type integer sorry I'll just give a meaningful name counter of integer type is equal to zero right and from here you can actually do counter plus plus mm. okay that's a lambda I will let me just remove the stripes for now oh sorry I just should know uh, because that's not the body that's the parameter stood okay I messed it up let me just go back guys yeah now here is the body so something like I don't worry I'll just fix it up for you yeah so here is the body as you can see right so what am I what is happening in here is uh, this first lambda right this function can actually capture the environment that it is in okay so counter is actually if you see it's outside the scope of the function and still that that function will increment the counter so I just have to print uh, counter also okay let's compile and see uh, how it works so you might have been uh, aware about ah, you can see the counter is one right here counter was zero so what happens in here so this is a kind of like closure function so, okay so the closure is nothing but a function or anonymous function or a lambda function which can capture uh, a variables or uh, you know types or something from its context okay from its closure so for for this function this first lambda function its closure is the, the main so main is the closure so for example in main whatever you define right whatever variables you define for example you know then this function inside this function you can actually capture it you know you can actually do manipulations you know increment decrement if you want to add something remove something do some action on it you can actually access in short you know so this is called a type of closure so these are like lambda closures so there are two kinds of closures lambda closures and anonymous function closures okay so this is like lambda closures so now how it's going to be useful you know this doesn't look useful at all right so I mean there'll be a situation for example if you so there are really useful on creating like custom loops and stuff like that let's create a loop function okay so it'll loop through and it'll do some sort of action right but you don't know what action you want to perform so what do you do you ask uh, for example items as a items as an array of int okay and you just want to increment and just give a, another array as output or you don't want to do anything right in short literally nothing so what do you do you actually expect uh, lambda okay uh, with uh, one uh, integer okay and uh, you're giving integer as output so this is kind of like your function right now uh, that you are implementing okay now what is happening in here parameter name expected okay and this will written nothing okay function loop and the web the parameter that we are passing first is uh, the item which is array 
of integer which is fine another one is uh, okay oh sorry so if this is uh, here is called so we'll call it the name closure there you go right so now what is happening is it's actually so we uh, you know function is not deciding what to do it is just going to do for loop okay like item in items and it's just going to call this function with your item in it okay that's it uh, okay let's create a function that will do some sort of transformation like mapping or something and it's, it'll again give array of integer so now what it do it will define array of integer for example where new items is again array of integer is equal to array of type integer boom right I just created an array of type integers now I'll go with them I'll wait for the, so this function again now need oh this function uh, whatever transform value right so I'll just a uh, value transformed value is gonna be integer is equal to this callback that this guy want to do and I'm just going to do new items dot uh, set I need index okay hmm so I need a way to push it or something right but I think I might have to go with index only so what do you do you'll have to define index also here fire index this is like kind of like hacky solution but I'm just trying to make a point in here that how you can use lambda efficiently okay so now okay index and transformed value then I'm just going to index plus plus it's that easy right okay so now as you can see I had to manage states and a lot of things and then I'm going to return at the end of the day new items so now what I just created a I just created a function that is going to or whatever well input value will give, it can transform it okay so let's see how it's gonna do so I'm just going to delete everything um, this also now how lambda can be really useful you know so this is oh sorry so this is actually the thing that you uh, when you are doing complex calculations everything right so this is actually to avoid a lot of confusions and stuff so now what happens is okay let me create an array here with the actual items okay items array of int is equal to array of int with 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 now I just want to double this item okay how should I do it let's see so I'm just going to uh, be like you know uh, where doubled is again this is the response we'll be getting okay of integer only is equal to loop let's just see uh, okay now loop and first parameter I'm giving uh, is array of that another parameter here in case I'm giving is a lambda so here lambda a will be type integer sorry or you can just say item okay and uh, what that will do is it will return mm, okay sorry for that uh, yeah so what is happening in here is I'm getting the a and there you go okay and what I'm going to do a plus a sounds good okay uh, I'll just do white um, type int hmm this is a bit tricky okay let me just create a separate lambda for you guys okay lambda is equal to take integer as input and give integer as output is equal to boom okay 
so item of type integer now this gets a little bit complex <coughs> and it'll take item plus item because we are doubling right so here you go so instead of writing all these things right what i can do i can literally just because i created lambda i can just give lambda and it should work see i told you okay i understand what was the issue i forgot to give this uh, parenthesis but that's okay so as you know how it works right okay now i can actually if you want i can just give it to you that like that okay now items now what is happening in here <coughs> i'll get parameter item of type integer okay and i'll create a body and i'm just going to do item plus item so you are you can see the right you can actually do the transformations in here and it's returning and let's just print it out double items doubled let's just compile and check it out how it works okay out of bound exception hmm nineteenth line here okay okay sorry i made a mistake in creating error so what we need to do is we need to create a with uh, Arrange uh, of size 10 and the lambda nothing. I don't want to give any lambda to this. Okay, well, no value pass. Okay. Hmm. This guy will accept a lambda, so. But yeah, I don't want to give any lambda there okay so i'm creating error let's just go through this okay mm -hmm. so this lambda needs to read in that i'll just uh okay so we are kind of stuck in here so instead of storing into this i'm just going to uh Print it out all the double values, I guess, you know, so instead of returning the array. Or what I can do is in the items only I can store it. I think that would be the better solution uh, instead of, you know, like storing somewhere else. Uh, or I can just do something like I just can copy new items is equal to items, you know. That's it, right? And then I can do because now it's the array, copied array let's just see how it works i should not throw some weird exceptions okay so we created an item we just didn't print it out okay so let's just uh, uh for item sorry new item in items items i need to do this otherwise again it will throw an error and you guys will think this guy forgot yeah i kind of <laughs> forgot it sorry for that uh okay tk i'm just going to print new okay new item now my philosophy is kind of like you know i don't like to actually remove all the mistakes that i made uh why because uh to just let you guys know you know that what kind of mistake you guys can make or even i can make the mistakes or something so here you can see the double item two four six nine eight ten now the actual thing shines is you know what if you want to triple these items see now important thing is you don't need to actually touch this loop function at all you know it's done now if you want to triple the item you just actually go here and whatever uh, uh, you are calling from right you can actually just create another closure functions or lambda functions and just uh, you know just pass it inside uh, 
the actual loop and it lets you actually triple so i'm not changing the logs and everything let's just compile and see if it's tripling or not it's just not about tripling the item you know you can do anything see it's three six nine twelve right so it's not about tripling the item you can do literally you can write any kind of lambda function here it, it can do any kind of transformation so that's why lambda is really useful and really uh uh, you know kind of uh, helpful when it comes to creating complex programs and, and automate a lot of things So another function is anonymous function. We already took a lot of time in lambda and closures. We actually finished So another function is anonymous function. So what is the I mean the difference between anonymous function and lambda functions? They are like Anonymous function if you see let me just give you an, a hint of uh, Anonymous function how it looks and everything but before that let me just delete this all uh, loop and everything okay mm, everything got deleted i don't actually have an issue okay so there you go okay now i'm creating anonymous functions okay the anonymous i'm just calling it a now if you see the type right anonymous function is a function without name so func which take integer as argument integer sorry not func it's just a fun integer is an integer ID and uh, it will uh, written integer sorry mm. okay is equal to punk a and why i'm keep writing funk i don't understand from b and and okay and i don't understand what this end errors are in here hmm interesting space near is to like what b oh i need to get the parameters yeah i need to get the parameters in here okay understood that thing now okay so let's just go through again just check it out how it works so i'm creating an anonymous function fun signature or input or <coughs> a of int b of int tk and it's written in int i just thought i should store it in variable or something you know uh, i written zero okay there you go now we can store this into f so this is called anonymous functions if you see the difference between now difference between lambda and anonymous function is nothing but these functions can actually return while lambda are expressions so they don't return they'll just give you one single value as a finishing of the function that's it you know so what whenever you want to finish the function in lambda you have to write last expression uh, that returns something that will lambda will be exp uh, expecting and these are anonymous functions they are almost same no difference but whenever you want to write written you can write anonymous function or you can write uh, lambda functions okay and let's talk about the higher order functions so if you go back right we actually created a higher order function and i just forgot to know uh, just mention you guys so function uh, that takes uh, functions as parameters okay that's called higher order functions so for example this loop right so it's taking function as a parameter or a returning function so in here we are not returning function but if it's returning the function just like this you know it will give you a signature like this then it is called higher order functions and half of the kotlin is made up with higher order functions so you gotta learn this you know you gotta learn uh, 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 lambda expressions mainly anonymous functions they might not be using that much but lambda expressions is the most thing so you gotta learn it so i think this is it from the advanced uh, functions okay uh, and uh, yeah uh, let me check in line okay so the last type that I just wanted to tell you is, you know, if you create an inline function, so whenever you create this lambda expressions, right, it'll actually assign one extra uh, because functions are object, you know, and I told you in Kotlin, everything is an object, right? So they do a lot of um, kind of allocations when you actually create lambda functions, you know, it's kind of like have its own way of doing the penalty and everything. <clears throat> 
uh, associating memory and everything so uh, to avoid that and you know and the get the best out of memory and optimizations uh, you can write inline whatever function that is x a uh, higher order function you can make it an inline function so uh, it will try to do optimization it will try to avoid allocating memory if it's not required okay so just make sure that you figure this in line out and you just try to put that uh, whenever you are using lamb uh, higher order functions which takes input as a parameter or as a, a function or returning the function as output lambda functions so another functions so this was it guys from function and uh, with this we are actually uh, i'm kind of you know like uh, finishing off with the basics of uh, Kotlin uh, in the next uh, section right I'm going to talk about uh, object oriented Kotlin that's where actual fun is you know so I'm pretty sure you guys must be a lot uh, so much bored with this <laughs> content by now I guess uh, just let me know your thought if you are bored and you think my videos are kind of like you know too much explanation and stuff like that I would love to get some feedback from you guys so thank you very much and we'll talk about OOP from next uh, section Okay guys uh be cool and keep coding Hey guys So this is we and uh today we are going to talk about object oriented programming with uh Kotlin but before we start doing that uh you guys need to know a little bit about object oriented programming right So just uh, I'll just take a few minutes to you know just uh, try to explain you uh, what is object oriented programming in nutshell <coughs> okay so what is object oriented programming so in object oriented programming or language is related to that everything all the types everything is actually object okay so for example if you are creating an integer right that's an object of some integer class or in uh, inbuilt class okay so what happens in object oriented programming is there are classes there are objects uh, there are uh, st uh, states and there are behaviors these four to five kind of things you need to make sure that you have and there are some advanced concepts you know like inheritance and polymorphism and all those kind of things we'll be talking about that uh, you know future uh, tutorials when we'll be learning how to do inheritance and uh, you know uh, uh, polymorphism and those kind of things in Kotlin okay so you got the basic idea right so when, whenever uh, you are working with uh, you know uh, ideology of uh, object oriented programming all you have to do is you know uh, create a classes now classes are templates for your objects okay so for uh, for example if you want to create a school management system or something right so you create a class for students okay now that student uh, you are actually templating so what should be there in the student so you can say it should be enrollment number you know uh, the name the address detail the guardian details you know all those kind of things should be present in the uh, student uh, object <clears throat> so when you create a new student right you actually create a, that student or ob student object based on this template okay so we can have some sort of type safety okay for example if you are creating now um, you have a template of student and you want to create a student object okay let's take an example that student one uh, zero zero one you want to create now you when you create a student right you know that this set of fields you actually need to fill to create that student okay and that will be uh you know uh same for all kind of students if it's student one or it's student one millionth you know so there will be a uh, you know uh, what do you call a symmetry between all of the students so it will create a kind of like common structure for student and that's how i think the whole uh, notion of classes and object oriented programming and you know those kind of things works so uh, let's get started okay this is like very basic uh, i mean there is a lot 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 more things to do in object oriented programming but you guys don't need to worry about that once you get uh, used to object oriented uh, programming you know basics you will figure it out and you will just keep asking questions you know and you'll just keep getting answers it's, it gets really deep uh, but let's not worry about that it's really fun uh, thing to do uh, object oriented programming and java as you know is de designed as object oriented programming so kotlin is also uh, something like that okay then uh, without further ado uh, let's get started okay so uh, first we'll uh, 
you know uh, create a class okay so what is class in Kotlin class uh, can be created using class class header and class body remember the structure okay <coughs> So in Kotlin, everything uh, is this. Now, uh, to create a class, you need to have this keyword class. Now, class header contains, uh, okay, class header con uh, contains class name, uh, constructor details, you know, default parameters, and uh, visibility modifiers, and some sort of annotations. Okay, we'll be taking a look at one, all those things one by one. And class body is nothing but your body, you know, all of your uh, properties, initialization blocks, and your member functions, and all those kind of things. See, it is that easy to uh, uh, create classes and uh, uh, in Kotlin. So let's get started. So let's create a class called student first. Class, I'll give a name student okay and i'm going to create some properties so properties going to be variables uh, so i'll just say variable uh, first name should be string no variable yeah you need to initialize at the time of creation all the property so it should be default or whatever you know last name because nulls are not allowed in Kotlin that's why you need to you know uh, initialize the property at the time of creation string is equal to empty uh, variable uh, age will put it's gonna be integer is equal to see here age cannot go beyond uh, you know um, <coughs> 100 or 150 right i mean that's like the maximum age so instead of that we can actually put byte type to save some memory okay this will be 8 bit and by default we'll put age uh, 0 because we don't want you know <coughs> where address is gonna be string is equal to empty string okay so these are like let's okay and we'll just create enrollment number Enrollment number is gonna be uh, mm, uh, It can be a bigger so I'm just going to be like I'm just going to make it long because it can get to billions a uh, ten uh, ten numbers or something, you know, so it'll be like one two three four five six seven eight nine zero So this is like enrollment number uh, It usually are longer so they define with something else But if it's number then we are we are just assuming this it's gonna be number. Okay, so this is like your simple uh, student class you can see right it's very easy you know you can just uh, do main and you can create variable student one okay is equal to this is how you uh, create a object from that student class here you go first name is so let's see if it's even valid or not you I don't think you can do something like this now undissolved reference right so you cannot do something like this you have to create constructor for that you cannot directly uh, you know uh, you if you want to update these properties right so how are you gonna do those kind of things you know how you update how do how to create uh, uh, properties you know so let's see uh, I'm just going to delete it out and uh, let's go uh, to the constructor before going to the constructor I just want to say you can actually create a class without body okay this is like empty class this is again a valid uh, class okay a class without any kind of body just to create a new type uh, uh, that uh, we can create uh, this will be useful when you are when we are creating some sort of enumeration classes or the class where you want to have some couple of options on the okay that's a future thing don't worry about it right now okay so this is how you create a class without body but header at least a name is required in the class field these two parameters are required to create a, uh, create a class and uh, remember all the classes by default are final classes like if you are from java or something like final classes are classes that you cannot overwrite you know they are like the finalized so in kotlin uh, all of those things right you have to explicitly specified you know that you want this class overridable or not uh, that's kind of like you know inheritance uh, topic we'll uh, we'll again figure it out in future uh, uh, videos uh, i just thought it should be you know uh, <laughs> the message should be conveying to you that everything is uh, finalized in kotlin because they don't have a concept of static right that's why 
okay uh, so what I'm going to do I'm going to uh, remove this now uh, okay let's uh, create a let's create a small object right now uh, uh, before that let's let's go through the constructors okay so what are constructors so constructors uh, in Kotlin are uh, like two types uh, primary constructors and secondary con constructors okay now the primary constructors will have to be only one and secondary constructors will be uh, there can be many secondary constructors okay uh, uh, th that being said uh, uh, <clears throat> okay let's get started and create a primary constructor uh, so to create a primary constructor set you see okay what do you do after name you like constructor that's it okay so this is now your primary constructor so primary constructor is actually a part of your uh, class header okay and then you can take parameters like uh, if you think that I just need like two fields which are required is like first name and last name and a first name and last names are required fields uh, let's just create uh, oh, sorry uh, I'll just take first name is gonna be string and remember you have to explicitly specify the type in here last yes it's required uh, that's what I like okay so here we created a constructor okay now if you want to create an object you can literally create the object uh, using this primary constructor how you do that simple you just create variable student1 student1 sorry for that is equal to student with first name I'm just going to give H know that I'm a student and last name I'm just gonna give a B and anyway that's my surname I know uh, it's pretty long I don't try to you know <sighs> speak it out loud <laughs> don't worry about that you can call me VJ that's cool or V uh, for short okay so this is how we create a student let's just print it out uh, the student class student but it's not going to print it out I guess so I'm just going to okay okay I'm just going to like print LN uh, the first name of the student is uh, student dot see and this is one of the really good thing you don't need to create getters and setters in uh, uh, you know uh, Kotlin uh, you can just do dot notation and you can just call this it's really good I mean Java also they have this support but for that if they need to be private and all those kind of things right but that's not in Kotlin okay last name is Taylor student dot last name boom that's there we go let's just compile and check it out if it's work or not <laughs> okay the first name of student a and empty is a okay so there is something wrong that we are not uh, looking at okay yes you know what's wrong yes because we actually got the property but we didn't actually initialize these guys you know definitely you got the point and this was not uh, intentional but yes now you actually figured it out right just passing the parameters won't gonna cut it so you have to initialize this now how you initialize it <clears throat> so remember one thing primary constructor does not have body unlike Java okay so primary constructor cannot contain any code so you might be thinking then how we initialize the code then really good questions so for that in Kotlin they have initialization blocks <coughs> okay now uh, you can uh, write multiple initialization block uh, no uh, you know uh, there is no limitation on how many you can write but for the you know ergonomics you should write one or two or three maybe initialization blocks uh, okay and the initialization blocks uh, they will get called uh, at the time of object initialization you know so this is where you create an object at the time this init blocks will be uh, called so let's see how to uh, create so to create an init block you, a block you have to write in it you I'll just print it out some uh, okay uh, in it called I'll just do something like that and uh, then I'm going to be like you know first name is gonna be like uh, first name uh, and last last name is gonna be like last name right uh, 
so now what i'm doing i'm initializing and i'm actually uh, providing those things uh, those values to our properties let's see if it's uh, uh, giving us a desired result or not uh see in it called first name of the student is vijay and last name is bambania so here you go so this is i mean if you see the way it's defined right i just love it you know the ergonomics the the way it's so clear cut you know that in it contains okay in it is in it block and you can actually write multiple in it uh, sorry uh in it blocks as i told you uh but you will be like then which one will be called first simple right uh i'll just show you second in it okay so they call in a uh, uh, you know order that they are uh, declared so this is like declaration of first in it block and this is second so it should be like in it called and second in it called uh, when we will be uh, uh, executing the code let's see yeah in it called second in it called and uh, so as you know right see this is like the beauty of this you can actually literally uh, keep you know putting all the blocks one by one one by one one by one and they'll be called and remember all of these init blocks will be called uh, uh, after primary constructor and before everything else you know but yes uh, even these properties that we are specifying right properties or field of the uh, they are like interleaved you know so you can literally uh, okay do something like control x i'll just do okay it's all in uh, order they are specified okay so what i'm what we are going to do is uh, i'm just going to create that uh, something like this okay and I just make it like uh, uh, first in it and uh, then i'm specifying all this and i'm just going to be like second in it okay now if you see right what's going to happen is um, now when this init block is called right these properties are not actually because everything is in order so if you be like you know uh, you like to do first name is equal to first name it won't work why because see variable cannot be initialized before it's declared right so everything in the inside the class is in order of uh, you know sequences so uh, this variable is not yet uh, defined you know so so if you see right init blocks are nothing but just sort of like initialization uh, functions you can say that uh, which are executed in uh, you know the same pair same level as the variable declaration so this everything is uh, in order it's not like that all the variables when you compile and create an object all the variables will or fields or properties will be created first and then all the inits will be called first no they are at the same level you know okay let's just compile and check it out if it's work or not uh, it's compiling successfully oops it's taking a little bit longer yeah first end it call second end it call and then it's all such uh, uh initialization and stuff so you got the idea how in it works right so this is how you initialize all of your fields in kotlin and uh, as i told you primary constructor does not have a you know body so okay and uh, other short thing okay uh, is you can actually declare so for example this thing right first name last name you don't need to declare like separately you can actually declare here only just create a where yeah this is and this is very ergonomics you know people uh tries to like write something like this now what happens in here if you see right then you don't actually need to uh even do this oh, sorry yeah so as you can see now uh, uh this is how you uh, declare uh, your properties uh, declare and initialize you can do sure something like this this is how you declare uh, this is optional you know this is like the default properties you know uh, but you can actually so what happened in here now the first name is actually a property of student class okay and last time is also a property of student class but we actually uh, declared and initialized at the constructor level okay let's see it should compile again mm. 
boom first second see there is no uh, thing right so this is how you can you know like for example if you have like a couple of properties which are required and you don't want to actually you know just put it out it's it's again a good ergonomics to actually just put it down in here unless you have like a couple of properties then you can just put it here and just be done with it but if you like tens or you know 15 or property and you are building some big class or something you you should actually put it here for the good documentation and you know good readability i mean that provides something like that okay so that's what that was all about unit blocks and you know properties and uh, uh, primary constructors uh of course you might be thinking that oh my god what if i want to do constructor overloading you know of course we have something for that that's called secondary constructors you know kotlin is like they actually learn a lot uh from uh, all the failures from you know other languages it is nothing it's actually uh you know just constructor overloading but in a little bit of different way so secondary constructors right a secondary constructors when you create them let's let's create a secondary constructor so secondary constructors can be created using constructor keyword that's it and secondary constructors can have body but remember one thing secondary constructors needs to delegate uh to the primary constructors okay so for example let's create a secondary constructors where we are asking for first name last name and age okay so it will be like first name string sorry last name oh shit oh sorry for that last name is again string and age is i think we had a byte so i created this constructor right see now this is a new constructor where you are giving three properties so what do you do you actually need to delegate this to primary constructors or another secondary constructors which actually delegates to primary constructors but remember that you know that you need to delegate you need to call the primary constructor that is the only way you create object in kotlin so secondary constructors when you create right this is like a method that is actually pushed towards primary so what in here is happening is this constructor will take everything and just pass it to this guy okay for example uh first name because uh it requires two parameters right last name and the third thing is uh uh age is equal to age okay and i'm just going to say secondary constructors called print ln secondary cons i'm just going to cons okay for constructors big name yeah, and i mean not know the spelling a lot of possibilities right okay so here uh, the secondary constructors has been uh, it's been you know uh, created now let's just go i'm just add add the age 26 oh this student is really old See, it's not throwing an error why because now we have this constructor in play okay so let's just create and see how it works can we do something like this yeah okay mm, the age is boom student one dot age there you go let's see nice first of course initializes block needs to be first then second and then secondary constructor called see and the first name is okay let's see if the primary constructor is calling or not but of course you cannot check it out why because but yes we can check it out as uh if the first name and last name are like you know defined because if you see right we did in secondary constructors we did not actually uh assign this first name and last name we just assign age and uh, uh you know age uh a property only so then we actually uh written it uh sorry delegated to uh the primary constructors that you refer using this class okay uh, this is the keyword to refer to the current context of the object of that particular class but the, this here is a primary constructor which is a class itself right so we are actually creating a class itself and returning it you know so what is happening in here so this constructor will call as a method it will assign just age and then it will return uh this new class okay so this will actually call this constructor and this will again go through the whole procedure you know uh before and uh, then it will uh assign all the first name last name and all the initialization will be called and stuff like that and then it will come here and just do the age thing 
so this is how you do the secondary constructors you can write so many secondary constructors you don't need to worry about that uh, okay uh, so and all secondary constructors it, this is like constructor overloading you know or parameterized constructors if you are using Java or Scala or something like that this is like that but it's very nice nice way of doing things a lot of code reusability for example if you create a constructor right and these properties are something a very bit complicated and a lot of complications are going on in here so see you are actually you don't need to worry about that what do you do yeah you just delegate to this uh, thing and it will again take care of so you are just writing code once you know so I think this is one of the beauty of the Kotlin lot of code user reusabilities and stuff like that uh, okay so that was the secondary uh, uh, constructor thing uh, and we also see how to define you know declare and initialize the classes in here just you don't need a new keyword or anything you just do where you call the student with uh, all the constructors that we have uh, primary constructors or secondary constructors mm. uh, of course and you uh, you might be thinking what if I don't have primary constructors uh, primary constructor sorry okay before that I just want to say that if we don't have any visibility modifiers right like you know it's like uh, private or something like that you know if uh, we will be talking about visibility modifiers in uh, maybe a couple of videos don't worry but if you don't have something like this right all any kind of annotations like you know um, something like that inject uh, something like that you know these are called annotations in Java or in Kotlin right then what you can you can actually avoid this constructor you know this is nice so you can just directly write this and it will just work fine literally fine I'm telling you why because you don't have any visibility modifiers so Kotlin will assume that okay this is just like this only you know okay and yeah and yes and the other thing uh, is what if you don't have any uh, primary constructors so we don't have any primary con if you see this class right if you remove this now we don't have any primary constructor so this constructor uh, does not need to actually delegate like this because there is no constructor to call right so in that case this will uh, be uh, then you will have to you know specify everything in here uh, so oh, then we have to define the methods in here also uh, sorry uh, properties first, first name is string empty well last name string empty okay and I'll just do in here first name is equal to first name last name is equal to last name okay and it should work just fine let's compile it down and run it out and let's just be done with it this is really I mean I like it you know the variations the Kotlin has right I mean okay as you can see everything works so this is if you don't have any primary constructors still you can have a secondary constructor but in that case you don't need to delegate to any primary constructors why because there is no primary constructor so whatever constructor you have you have to initialize based on that brilliant okay uh, looks good to me okay one more thing can we define the method uh, sorry properties from the secondary constructors let's see I mean I think we should be able to let's just see variable first name string yes we can this is brilliant so you might never have to you might never have to write any properties you know where last name okay no 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 see you cannot define <laughs> uh, variables in secondary constructor so it's kind of bummer for you guys I just wanted to you know just make sure every possibility is taken care of you know so you guys don't get confused yes in secondary constructors you cannot uh, define declare and initialize your uh, properties that's only a job of primary constructor okay so this is uh, all about you know how to create a class and the class header and class initialization blocks and class primary constructor class secondary constructor okay and uh, let's talk more about uh, classes in future uh, okay now before that okay I just want to uh, 
give you a sneak preview of uh, how to create a member functions in class okay now the member functions right they are just functions but one thing is they have uh, access to context of the class okay and second thing is the uh, their scope is limited to this object that's it let's create a f just simple function you know uh, print values or print student okay it won't take anything and it won't give anything but I just going to print ln it is just going to print it okay 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 I'm just gonna be like first name is this dot first name this is how you access it okay hmm plus up oh, sorry last name this dot last this is again is the context of the class you remember age Oop. easy peasy okay so now we don't even need to actually print and do everything else that we did here right so whenever you sorry whenever you create a class you can just say student one dot print student right okay print student okay there you go see so you don't need to actually define you can actually print it again and again instead of writing uh, all those big print right you can just define it that object level once and on all the objects you can just use that code boom first secondary right first name is visual last name is Bambania age is 26 so as you can see we can actually call this member function so this is how the member functions where you can actually pass parameters and all the functionality that function provides right it is applied in here okay so the previous video of functions all those things actually applied here just the scope is will be the scope won't be a global the scope will be at a class level okay so you can access between this class and it will be called on that particular object you cannot call without an object okay and yes you can uh, access all of these uh, state uh, very uh, properties using this that's it so this is the whole crux of the object oriented programming is okay and we'll be talking about uh, there are other few things that we need to talk about that we'll talk about in future tutorials don't worry but this is like the basics of object oriented programming this is actually good enough for you to get started with you know object oriented in Kotlin and remember this all class are like types only so you created this right you can actually pass as a type like the way we created this first name right you can actually so for example here i can uh, literally just say that this is a, a type student okay and it should work why right? because we uh, by the, by creating a class you are creating a type so and i told you right in kotlin everything is an object of some particular class and this is how the strictly type languages works if you can take advantage of this phenomena you know you will be i can guarantee you removing so many errors because you have to define all those kind of things right and you just go through that strict notation you know strict constructors and you know all those kind of things right a lot of checkings will be done at compile time and a lot of very uh you know um uh errors will be solved and stuff like that so yeah this is it uh for uh the you know introduction to classes and stuff like an object object oriented programming in Kotlin uh, let's uh, wrap it up for now and uh, we will be doing something uh, good in future uh, tutorials thank you very much guys hello guys this is we and in this video we are going to talk about inheritance well if you know a little bit of object oriented programming that you might be aware that inheritance is one of the base principles or very important principles or you know uh, like methodology uh, you know in OOP okay so what is inheritance uh, 
well inheritance uh, in a general way if you think right means inheriting you know for example uh, there if there is a very rich uh, person right who's got like 100 million dollars in the bank you know and now he's got only one son i'm talking about son in here okay so when that person dies or it doesn't die it's not necessary that that guy needs to die okay <laughs> so the son is going to inherit all of the money and all of the assets and all of the uh, you know uh, business that the father is having okay that's one example another example is what uh, for example uh, if you know and i'm not trying to be racist in here or anything like that but if you see right a chinese person or an indian person or an american or american or european person right if they when they give birth to child you know their child's have similarities in you know look or in color or in you know some way of uh, hairstyle or some sort of look or some sort of you know genetic similarities right so that's uh, that is uh, you know again it's called inheritance like they inherited some properties or some some uh, behaviors from the parents to the children right so the same way inheritance works in op you have a base class or you can call them a parents and you have a child class or sub class or derived class in the case of op which have access to all the parent properties okay okay if you don't understand don't worry we will be writing code just about now and see how it works okay so okay let's create a class so before i create a class i just want you to know that you know all the classes in kotlin have one common super class or one common parent it's called any okay so all the classes you know and you know in kotlin everything is a object of some particular class right so everything is a class in uh, you know or kotlin so they all have one common parent it's called any so they all are inherited from there and now any does not have any properties it's just an empty class okay uh, but he just had like couple of methods you know uh, two string and this and that so yeah not to worry about that just i just wanted you to know that you know there is a one common parent a root parent uh, in kotlin uh, for all the classes and remember this is not like java's you know if you are doing some java you know that java uh, has again one common class called object this is not related to that objects is a lot of behaviors and stuff but here in this case any does not have any behavior or any property it's an empty class and you know that and kotlin class can be empty without body right we just discussed last tutorial okay so without further ado let's get started okay so let me create a base class okay we will here go with the uh, you know uh, analogy of uh, Mm, parent and child okay so let's create a parent class okay so one parent can have many child as you know right but for now we will create a class parent okay now parents got some you know uh, looks which I will give string you know or I'm just gonna give array of string you know but because why not right array of string mm, tall I'll just write couple of those and some okay okay now it's got the looks and we'll just say where money is long because this guy you this guy is rich so let's give them hundred million yeah in Kotlin you can actually separate this number by this so this looks good right okay this is hundred mil and what else parent has some business 
some business means uh, I don't know I'll just write it in number uh, worth of uh, sorry this is uh, 1 million I'm just going to put 100 million and this code business again of 100 million okay so now you see parent is set now if you see the parent class doesn't have any uh, default constructor or anything like that so you need to create at least one constructor hmm okay so the thing is when you create a child right before that you need to have a parent okay mm -hmm. I think this analogy is not going to work okay so let's let's get started with the analogy of a, a person and a student okay so what I meant to say is okay the person can be student okay so yeah let's see, let's get started let's just create a super class called person person okay now person's got name okay which is string which will be empty and person's got edge it's gonna be integer default is zero it's got uh, what are the common things okay because all the super class right they just internet you know common things so we just need to write it down a little bit of common things in here uh, so name everybody every kind of person have name age or some sort of ID you know I'm just going to put in T but uh, you can have like passport or you know uh, social security number or other card if you are from India so those those kind of things you know so ID I just going to put in teacher of zero again because let's just just say ID is zero one two for now okay so now this is like the common person okay and now uh, if you see it, it doesn't have any constructors you cannot create any common person you know you need to have a constructor so I'm just going to give a primary constructor and we are not putting any visibility so I can just directly write it down name string h int and id int okay so when i'll be call it in it i will be just name sorry and just like name h id oops there you go okay now person is created okay and I'm just going to create one function to like you know uh, print person or something print person it's going to print it out how print Helen name is this dot name slash and enter H is this dot H and ID is this dot ID well as you know print person TK so now we have a okay and I'm just going to put a person can be without ID for now okay I just uh, I know I know No, no, I have some so because I want to create another constructor so just you know secondary constructor when a person can be in name H I I didn't okay this will delegate to hmm, this with name age okay and id we are going to give id id oops i need to do is equal to okay so what now we have is we have a primary constructor and just put it down just for the betterment of everybody else right just so they can understand so now I created a person class where I have a primary constructor I have a couple of parameters 
I have a three properties, you know, I have innate, I have a secondary constructor, I have one function. Okay, a member function. Now I'm going to create a base class. Okay, class. Now student can be person, right? So whenever you want to extend a class, okay, of super class, you do colon person. Okay, now this is how you extend a class. Now here is a thing, okay? One of the really good thing about Kotlin is in Kotlin everything is a final. So if you are doing a Java or something like that, right? It's very complicated static logic that you have, right? This static method, this static class, and all the st static variables and stuff like that. Kotlin doesn't have anything like that. In Kotlin, everything is a static or everything is a final by default, okay? So in the case of class, all the classes are final by default. Means they cannot be overridable. They are not overridable, you know. You don't have permission to override it, okay? So if you see, right, this type is final, so it cannot be inherited from, right? So you will be like, what? Then how are we gonna do that, okay? So if you want to override, you have to make that class open. Okay, first thing. So when you do open, right, it's showing, see, this subclass by student. So now open, now this class can be overridable any number of classes. It's that easy. Now this class is, but now of course, now again, one uh, one more uh, error is this type has a constructor because we need to construct it, right? It's got a primary constructor. And this guy doesn't have any constructor. Don't worry, so we'll create a constructor. We'll just take name, string will name, because student is also again right H and ID ID we don't need actually but uh, you know let's create a person class with name and age that's it all the errors are gone now you can see in here right whenever for example you will create an object of student right Internally, there will be uh, so student will inherit all of the properties and all of the member functions of person which are uh, accessible. Okay, so now we are doing what we are doing is when you create a student internally, the person class uh, will also be, will be initialized in here. Okay, so and yes, now student already has these three properties. Okay, name, age, and ID. Uh, so from the name and ages are here uh, you know assigned already and in in it of this you can literally just say ID because it contains ID yeah? because it inherited it right if person has ID this guy's got the ID we don't need to like specially write it down of ID boom see let's just call this main variable student one is equal to student name bj okay and uh, sorry age is gonna be 26 what are we waiting for oh we have a third parameter id is 22 just write it down okay see okay let's just see print we don't need to undo print and because you already have a print function right so you can just say print person so this will print student why because it's already defined so as you know right this is the main magic with the you know inheritance you have a lot of stuff already defined you don't need to do that do any of the work name vj 26 22 right see i didn't have anything in student but still you know i'm, I'm able to do this so this kind of inheritance is really really important uh, when you are doing some sort of database uh, for example if you're writing an application right where you have like four kind of databases you know and uh, to create a common interface between all four kind of database you can do something like you know open class db which does read which does write and everything and with some specific parameters and you can just override all those reads and writes methods you know uh, and just uh, do the work i think maybe if i'll create a project based you know video tutorial series on kotlin uh, then i will be showing you guys <laughs> so don't worry about that if you want that series you know especially uh, that yes we want something that advanced level you know <laughs> where how, and real projects how to use inheritance and everything just uh, hit me up on my twitter handle 
or just message me on wherever you are watching this video so i will just get back to you as soon as possible thank you very much for that yeah that's gonna be fun i guess so this is uh how you uh write you know inherit uh you know uh, from parent now you might be thinking the okay this is all good but uh but remember one thing you know we have a secondary construct right so if you have id available you can actually write it down id uh okay and it will work yeah and so what will happen is in here see this is nothing this is just an initialization or creation of this person class object okay so whatever constructor constructor you have you can actually use it okay now what if this guy doesn't have any constructor how is going to sound okay now the student doesn't have any constructor but a person has got a constructor so we need to initialize how you going to do that uh, it's simple easy you just have to okay in this kind of situation you you need to have a secondary constructor right at the time you just take name as a string age as a integer and id is integer it's the same thing you know and then you use super keyword to initialize the person with name age id it's that easy okay in this case we don't need this okay just one line and we have everything ready now student is all person and it should work so as you can see right so second you know whenever you have a secondary constructor you use super keyword to do all the uh, so uh, all the kind of things and uh, okay so this is just class level overridable what if you want to actually override this person and you just want to add type is equal to student so again i told you in kotlin everything is explicit we just need to write open okay now it it becomes overridable otherwise it's not overridable you cannot override that and we'll go to student we'll just and here when you override a uh, override a method or member function you have to write override function print person right okay so whenever you override the uh, you know uh, this print person first thing you have to do you have to actually call the uh, you know this uh, super class uh, function why because they might have some sort of initializations i don't think it's required let's just see if it's throwing an error or not we'll just do println with i'll just add type student okay and we'll do name uh this dot name because it's initialize let's just see you know i think it should be And this is gonna get interesting i guess okay let's see if it's compiled or not yes it is compiling so you don't need to actually call unless it's necessary you know if okay type student vj now you can see that right so we all added this function print function okay so in, when you call it on student what is going to happen is instead of printing this it's going to override this and it's to print this most of the time it's always you know good practice to do this kind of thing super dot print person why not sorry not just super dot print person but uh call this because this function might be doing some sort of uh, work where it's initializing or it's calling some third party service or something like that so it's good idea but uh, this example it's okay it's not required so it's just printing right so it's not required okay so but you got the idea right if you want so by default everything is a private you cannot override it but to make sure that function to make it overridable you have to make it again open and then you have to do override but remember one thing this is uh, override when you do this overridable right and some other class is actually uh, you know uh, uh, inheriting from student right at that time this will be become or this will become override uh, open by default so to stop that you have to use final keyword okay so now this guy is not overridable and yeah it's redundant model why because nobody's overriding and now if i'll create uh, some other third class uh you know third uh third class right with uh that class is inheriting from student at the time i'll have to make it this final will work so this function is print function is not overridable when you actually inherit from student so yeah uh so this is all uh 
good now you can even actually you know or write the variables also for example this name string this this right uh, what if this is just a readable okay uh, no right now let's not go there but yeah you can actually override for example you can do something like uh, where name string or something like that but see it's not overridable right because it's already uh, has so what you have to do is uh, we have to make it again this variable open and then we have to do override see so this should work now again okay so you you got the idea right so whenever uh, you have a base class or parent class everything is private by default to make anything open for overridable okay name won't be coming why because uh, we actually recreated this name and we never assigned it you know so in the constructor actually we can do something like you know this dot name is gonna be name let's see if it's work hey yeah it works so what happens okay uh, everything is a close by default if you see right but to make it everything open or overridable just keep putting over open 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 and whenever you do just override or uh, you know override something like that to stop override just use final again to make it you know again kind of static so nobody can override from this guy okay so this is the whole concept of uh, inheritance uh, okay i guess uh, that's in that way we are done with the basic level of inheritance uh, just remember these open and overridable things uh, okay so that was it guys for uh, inheritance um, uh, maybe i'll see you in the next tutorial uh, with uh, some again another advanced concept about op so stay tuned thank you very much guys hello guys <coughs> So in this video, we are going to talk about some uh, different different types of classes. So Kotlin has got like a few uh, types of classes. So I'm just going to just yes, you know quickly uh, go through uh, the syntax and the purpose uh, and uh, you know some rules and regulations about those classes. Uh, I'll be mostly going through the class which are mostly used. You know which are like. Uh, uh, one of them is a data class uh, so the, so m mainly classes are nothing but the structures right so mostly we used to actually store it as a data container you know for example if you have a person class right so you uh, and you have want to go through hundreds of person what do you do actually create and store it right you don't do anything you know so for so th for those kind of use case Kotlin th people thought you know why don't we just create a, a, a special kind of class and uh, uh, because if you see right data classes like uh, some specific uh, behaviors uh, repeatable for example printing out the data copying one class to another class and those kind of things right uh, they have like you know repeatable so they thought why don't we create a special kind of class and they just you know user just provide the properties and we'll internally generate all the methods I mean that sounds really good okay getters and setters and all those kind of things you know they'll just uh, generate internally so let's see how it works just let's just have an introduction about so data class is created using data class person and I'm just going to go through the best practice okay how you should write so whenever you write a data class okay there are some restriction one restriction is uh, uh, you know it should have one uh, primary constructor uh, at least sorry uh, it should have primary constructor with at least one uh, variable uh, sorry parameter okay and it should have a primary cons uh, constructor and uh, all the parameters right they should be actually uh, declared properties you know they shouldn't be like just uh, parameters you know uh, so for example declared property means variable person name is string and variable age is int something like this so now you can see that right so this is like a sort of like a person data class okay sorry nothing okay yeah so this is a person class you can see that okay if you do something like this this is not allowed because it won't know right it should need to have this 
because what happens is when you create a data class right internally if you see right when you are doing this you are actually defining a properties of this particular class so what data class except expect is you define all of the properties in here of course when you implement this class you can actually give uh, extra properties uh, like id zero but what happens is you know uh, the when the compiler is going to compile it it's not going to generate any kind of helper method for this so you should not uh, ever do something like this you should always go through something like this you know okay and uh, uh, one more important thing this class are not overridable means it should not be open it should not be sealed it should not be inner class or it should not be abstract class remember open class sorry data class should be just uh, used for uh, data only and nothing else remember that uh, this is the bad play, uh, best practice you can say data class student okay where name string you know and you can just say and all number integer zero something like that okay sorry something like this so as you can see see it's really good right you can now pass around this class in some method and you know you do all those kind of things uh, okay so this is like a data class another class is a nested class and inner class okay so nested class is nothing but you know you just write class inside class right this nested class so let's grab person uh, okay inside this if i want to create another class call mm, behaviors not that it's uh, the right analogy but this is how you can create right but remember one thing for example i'll just person name string is equal to zero right why I'm doing this man this is like the mistakes okay okay so if you want to do this right this uh, how are you going to access this name you cannot access this name right expecting member declaration see so you cannot access that name dude it's that easy so what what you do instead you just write inner okay then you can actually access that name using this dot okay let me check it out oh i might have to oh shoot man Hey, should I, yeah, 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 see, this is what happens when I fake this. Hmm. Okay, you can directly uh, get it like, you know, where another name string is equal to name. Boom, this is easy, right? So this is how you create inner class. Uh, there is no significant difference in inner class just other than accessing you know let's just remove this see now you cannot access this why because it will it won't know you know you, you have to go through everything else means you have to have a so for example now let's create a class okay p is equal to person oh, oh, i don't have constructor I'll just say constructor Hmm. Where age zero? Okay, sounds good. Hmm. Okay, but this doesn't make any sense because this is an error. It cannot access. To access that, you need to have inner. Now it can access. Now you do p right. You can literally uh do you know p dot behaviors is a class that we created dot another name so this is how you access using dot notation right so only difference between inner class and nested class is for example whenever you want to create a nested class but you want to access outer classes variable at that time you just have to define this class inner class so you can directly reference this variable with this if you do something like this that you just cannot access those right because it's it got its own scope and everything and it's not accessible from 
uh, sorry and it 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 not it's not going to be like uh, all the outer uh, scope is not going to be accessible inside this class so i think this was it guys you know we learned data class nested class and inner classes there are a few other variations but i'm not going through it right now if i required i might add it out and just put on video or put it on youtube or something so you guys can see but these are like the usable classes you know other classes uh, they have but i don't think that they're, they're being used that much so i just thought just leave it and let's not <laughs> give you guys so much confusion with a lot of varieties of classes okay so this was it guys uh next tutorial we are going to talk about uh, my personally you know uh, interesting topics generics and interfaces uh, i think these are the two things which are remaining uh when it comes to op in kotlin uh these are really good also i mean they are not related to op interface yeah but they are more into high level of you know type languages kind of programming and stuff like that so let's see how it goes i mean thank you very much guys see you on the next tutorial hello guys this is we again and in this tutorial we are going to talk about visibility modifiers i know you must be waiting for this you know you will be like oh security and uh, access control and all those kind of things right okay it's not that much actually it's but it's really good practice in a way if you think it's classic uh, object oriented uh, you know thing uh, so uh, okay in kotlin also they have like uh, visibility modifiers you know because java supports it so they might thought uh, why not and it's good only it's really useful you know i mean if you are doing you know, if you are going for like a high level of and scalable you know programs and libraries and this is one of the things which is really useful this what i think okay so there are four ways four types of visibility modifiers in kotlin uh, i'll just pff, uh, write it down any one is a private okay oops you cannot actually write it down as a kotlin file so i'm just going to you know uh tell you uh, okay one is private another one is protected another one is public and the last one is internal okay as you can see there are like four kind of modifiers uh okay so by default all the data members when you create a class right for example class person Okay, by default, uh, all the data members are like public. So you write like variable uh, name string empty, right? So by default, this is public. So you can actually write public here. That wouldn't make any sense. You see, it's already giving that uh, redundant visibility modifier because it doesn't make because by default it's public. But you can write something like you know, oops, something like. Uh, private and that would make some sense okay so now let's create why the private in here okay so why the private private means you know it'll be just only accessible through class okay see there is nothing that much to do when it comes to visibility modifiers uh, you can just read it out online no big deal so uh, but in Kotlin there are like different different ways to do that you know if you are writing inside package right uh, or in one particular file so the effect of visibility modifier it'll be different when it comes to file level or it'll be different when it comes to module level and it'll be different when it's come to uh, comes to class level you know so but it's again you know it's all access you know as I told you private means you know uh, you can actually access inside that particular scope so for example if you are defining a class then inside this particular class only you can do if you are uh, talking about like for example some private uh, function right uh, abc something like this okay uh, so this private function when you write at file level right this will be actually available uh, in the main dot kt only you cannot access outside okay so these are like uh, three levels of uh, you know uh, protocols they have uh, for file level for package or module level and for uh, class level so for class level this is it and protected when it comes to class level right you can actually access for class and all the subclass that extend that particular class and the public is by default you know public means visible to everyone else and internal is kind of like a new kind of uh, you know <laughs> visibility modifier uh, 
uh yeah so uh mainly it's for the module uh kind of thing so for example if you are building some sort of module or something like that so that will be actually accessible throughout that module only not the file or something like that uh so this is like i uh, know i and i will be talking about visibility modifiers uh, about, uh when it comes to packages and you know uh, modules uh talk which is actually covered in advance uh kind of kotlin you know <laughs> because i thought it'd be good idea you know to give thought because uh, after that you can actually create your own uh packages and modules and your libraries and stuff like that yeah and, and here module is actually a library that you're creating you know so that library level access if you for example if you're creating a library right and if you want some variable to be available at the library level but not outside of that particular library right so that's called module you know so at <laughs> that time you can actually because one module can contain so many packages you know and one uh, and in kotlin file and packages are a different thing you know for example if you're in java right it's kind of makes sense you know that to create a package and uh, in kotlin um, multiple fly files can belong to one package also you know so but, but this is all those things you know we will be talking about in uh, uh, packages and uh, imports i actually have a dedicated uh, uh you know plans for uh, that because it's something to we need to look take a look at you know to understand the overall structure of uh, big applications and when you are going to build a big applications you know you need to have those ideas so yeah that's it for now i mean just if you want more information you can just read it out there is nothing to program or something you know in here uh it's all like uh it's, it's so these are like these things right for example if you're creating some sort of a data structure or some sort of okay let's say server you are creating right so at the time the server level tcp connection right you don't want actually access to give access to anybody else you know at the time you can just keep it private you know so once it's created inside server it should not be accessible to anybody else why because server is only who's going to just accept the connections right not <laughs> not anybody else can you know just go and start listening to that particular tcp so those kind of things but it comes with the experience you know all these uh, visibility modifiers right uh, if you see a lot of languages they don't even have support for this they just have like private and public you know just make everything hide or just show everything something like that but yeah it's good to have some bit of elaborated you know <laughs> modifiers uh, but yeah it's all uh, sort of like philosophical and you know like logical thinkings uh, there is nothing to program in here so yeah that's it guys for this visibility uh, thing uh, Uh, okay see you in the next tutorial Hey guys this is VJ and today we're going to talk about interfaces hmm Well this is more of an interesting uh because you know if you are doing java or kotlin or something right you might be using this you know already too much If you're not using this then I think you're not taking advantage of full blown OOP functionalities you know that's what I can tell you because I'm pretty sure this is one of the really interesting and useful uh, concept uh, you know uh, when it comes to OOP programming so let's just you know talk about it uh, what is interface and why do we even need interface okay so it, it, let's just before we get into programming you know let's just think in a general way what is interface what comes into your mind when you talk about interface okay interface like uh, uh let's take uh, for example computer interface right so for example what comes to your mind computer interface i mean so means it allows you you know to do certain uh, things right for example keyboard is one of the computer interface right uh touch screen is one of the computer interface you know but what do you do with the keyboard you type keys right and you have certain functionality you know for example if you want to write something you need to type all the keys and then key will convert uh, get converted into ascii code and those ascii code can you know then uh, uh, you know be printed on the screen or stored on the file or you know bytes and everything all this functionality but now let's see if you have a mac computer okay and you're using mac keyboard can you use another keyboard with this uh then uh, yes if it got all the number keys and all the character keys and space and all the other keys which are required you know and which are supported by mac you know make a uh, mac motherboard or whatever right so that part you know that part is called interfacing okay <coughs> so interface is nothing it's just an a description of uh, the action and object uh, you know can do and must do 
so you understand right <clears throat> so for example uh, let's take another example of a uh, light you know light and uh, sorry switch and bulb okay switch and bulb let's take an example so what is the functionality of the switch and what is the functionality of the bulb okay so the functionality of the switch is uh, when you turn it on okay so the f functionality is simple turn on or turn off what is not specified you can uh, turn anything on and anything off right the only conditions are you know when you turn off power should be cut off when you turn on power should you know allowed to pass on uh, through the switch right so that is the functionality of the switch now if you want any object to be switch you have to build that functionality in your object and then your object will be switch it's that easy and what is the functionality of the bulb you know it you just turn on and turn off that's it so if you want your object to you know uh be bulb uh, when you turn on it should you know like uh throw some lights out and when you turn off it you throw stop throwing the lights out it's that easy so this is how interface works you know again i am telling you that it's just a description of actions you know then object uh, you know which uh, which can do and which must do you know the same way uh, in oop interface is nothing it's just a description of all the functions an object must have in order to be that particular interface or x in this case okay or bulb in this case um okay so let's see how to do uh, interface in kotlin okay now i'm pretty sure you guys must be uh, you know little bit of clear about you know the <laughs> interfacing concept or you have done some programming that you are like totally clear what is interface already you have idea okay so in kotlin uh, we can create interface using keyword call interface how surprising it is so this is your interface you can give interface like my interface that's it and uh, then you can create a class something called a and you can pretend that the class is a see this is whole unit okay now what happens is this class is behaving like my interface you know uh now it doesn't have any functionality so by default it is there right okay so this example won't give you any idea so i thought why don't we just go through you know one detailed example you know uh, uh the example of bulb and switch right so okay let's create a class a uh, switch okay mm, it doesn't have any uh properties well it can have color and size and everything but that's not the part of you know the interesting that we are talking about okay so let's create a function uh turn on okay let's create another function turn off okay now this is a specific kind of switch we which can turn any kind of bulb on and any kind of bulb off okay this is like a bulb switch okay now it can take any kind of bulb right so we need to come up with a solution for it okay let's create a bulb i'm creating a bajaj bulb okay one class bajaj bulb it's got function you know <coughs> Mm. on means i'll for now let's not just go any bulb but actual bulb so i'm just going to say okay but charge bulb on okay off and this is going to be that easy right so now bulb can be on or off okay and switch can be turn or turn off now to it can take bulb right so i'll just like you know bulb and bajaj bulb okay i'm just going to do uh let's see bulb dot it's on so on 
Now again to off I need a bulb which is sorry a charge bulb I'm keep printing like this okay so as you can see mm, this should work perfectly fine let's create a one readable bulb a charge bulb BB is equal to Mm, but charge bulb is equal to but charge bulb. Let's create a switch of type switch is equal to switch. I'm gonna do switch dot turn on. Let's see. I need to pass on bulb, which is a BB that I'm passing. Hmm. Okay. It should compile and run. It's that easy. Bajaj bulb on, right? Now that you know, after some time, I thought, oh, Bajaj is a good and whatever. But I want to add Philips bulb. So let's create a class. Philips bulb, right? Okay. Just gonna just copy best because yeah okay hmm interesting isn't it now how are you gonna do this so to do that you might have to like create two functions again you know like like this turn on Philips turn off Philips it's gonna take Philips bulb Philips bulb right then you have to create another Philips bulb Philips bulb PB See still not working Okay Now it should work But what is the issue with this okay it should work of course it will work but uh, do you see the issue in here sorry because I just printed out don't worry guys this is uh, Philips Philips shit man okay whatever okay but as you can see the issue in here is you know class yes we created but see for switch we need to create interface for all kind of bulbs you know now what if there are hundred kinds of bulbs you know <laughs> you don't want switch to be like that TV size right so what switch will do instead of this is switch will say that I will have a common interface okay here the interface come into the play I'll take all kind of bulbs okay which will have a function of on and function of off I'm not specifying what functionality you should you know do with the on or off but all I care about is you need to have these functions on or off okay so let's see how much code I'm reducing I'm deleting this you know so but I'm just saying that any kind of bulb will be fine unless as far as it's got this method on or off right see so now you can create hundreds or even thousand kinds of blah bulb and switch still will have these two methods only okay okay now we'll go to here 
now bajaj bajaj bulb is still now not comparable why because we need to make it bulb so to make it bulb we need to implement this interface okay and to internet we, uh, implement we need to override override that's it so now our bajaj bulb is a kind of bulb that our switch supports so it should turn on now if you see instead of bajaj bulb you can actually give a type of bulb why because it's bulb you know we actually made it to be x i told you right in the previous definition this is the x and we have a switch and you know even philips bulb let's make philips bulb also a bulb easy right now it's bulb we need to just override both the functions easy easy peasy so for example if if you want to actually create a third kind of bulb what do you do you just create a class that extend the bulb and you actually override on and off methods and you are done that's it you don't need to change anything in the interface bulb or you don't need to change anything in the interface switch nothing just create a class that extend uh, or implements this interface you know it's that easy now then you create an object of type okay bulb switch you provided da 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 so here i'm just because now philips is also a bulb if you see right now see both are bulb so instead of just doing different different method you can actually give switch turn on philips bulb you know you don't need to just like you know <laughs> turn off that bulb okay so see you can see the interface is really good now it's really you know a very uh, ergonomic means you can easily extend and this is like the scalable architecture you can put thousands of bulb kinds and it will work but charge bulb on philip bulb on right because whatever functionality you need to provide you are actually building just you know you are overriding the interface that switch needs so this is like the common method of interface uh one other thing is you know you can actually provide the default implementation you know print ln let's see so for example turn on right if nothing's on do nothing just print it out oops sorry already it print ln so mm, this is for example if someone so for example uh, right now in this interface there are just two methods right there will be an time where if you are building some sort of really complex uh, you know uh, system there might be so many methods in, involved in some interface right but now you don't want all the you know uh, objects to uh, or classes who are implement that interface to you know implement all the methods right but they need to have those all the functionality so instead of that you can actually provide a default functionality inside interface only so we have provided this let's for philips let's just comment this thing out okay mm. okay i tried doing with vim but it didn't work i need to install the plugins okay now turn on okay so let's see hmm it's compiling so boom this is a default method right means what happens in here the philips bulb you cannot turn it on because philip bulb didn't provide but instead of short circuiting right the interface itself will take care of it that this is you know i'm not sending power because whatever you know uh, i don't care i just i'm just going to alert you that this is default method or whatever you know so the thing is now it just needs to implement a turn off method you know off method that's it so for example if you have 50 methods right and uh, one object just needs to implement like three to four methods you know you are not going to like implement all other remaining methods that's what you do you just give some default implementations of that particular method so this is how uh, interface uh, you know works in uh, kotlin it's really it's super 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 useful if you can take advantage of it you know you will be writing a way 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 less amount of code you all you have to do is just you know 
uh, create a system where you identify all of the components you know and between the components so where interface come into the place so between the components you provide the interface so for example if you have a mvc kind of architecture right uh, so in the all the model right uh, for example in mvnc so model is uh, you know connected with view view is connected with controller and something um, uh, on a, some some specified flow right so now model is what data is right all the data and all the you know data structures and everything so what you can do is you can actually create an interface like a read interface and write interface with some specified uh, uh, you know classes look when i read i need uh, you know and return a class of data and when i write i need uh, you know uh, i will give a class of data and uh, then uh, <clears throat> so instead of uh, without interface what you have to do you have to create a read and write method for all the data sources right for example if you are doing some sort of like postgres uh, storing in postgres then you have to do for that if you are storing as a cache in redis then you have to do that and you write all, yeah, all the logic and all those kind of things right but what you can do is you can actually create this and every um, a data source you know will implement that uh, thing uh, interface you know model interface or data interface okay so uh, you you don't have to do anything you just say you know database dot read and because and you pass on whatever parameter you have to pass like postgres or redis or whatever data source right and it'll take care of it everything you know so a lot of code you can actually you know avoid writing by just using interfaces uh, uh on the implementer side but uh, sorry on the use usage side and it'll so it like resolve a lot of your complexities and everything you know uh so okay just read more about it if you can just let me know if you have any questions you have my twitter handle already so thank you very much guys and next tutorial we are going to talk about generics another really interesting and important topic when it comes to you know be building big systems and stuff okay guys thank you hello guys this is vj again so in this tutorial we are going to talk about generics or you can say the basics of generics you know because the advanced concept is coming in my advanced kotlin series well let's not talk about the advanced thing right now let's just see what the generics is okay so last i think uh video we talked about uh interfaces so inter what interfaces does is they define the behavior right uh like what kind of you know object should have some what kind of functions and stuff like that to behave like this object you know so in op if you think right you have behaviors in you have a state or data right so uh interface generalize the behavior the same way generics generalize the data flow so for example i'm pretty sure you don't understand so for what if uh, you want to build a function okay so wouldn't it be nice if function work on a class a as well as class b as well as class c so one function can take care of three class instead of building three 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 different different functions and that work on three class i mean i find it really good so that's what the generics is you know it generalize on data okay so what do you do you create a generic types and you just keep passing through that and again when you are using it right you know you can just specify that concrete type and uh, you know it will take care of it so let's see how to define a, a generics uh, or in kotlin okay so generics uh, so we will be uh, talking about uh, defining generics in uh, types and defining generics in uh, functions okay or class okay let's start with the class so we'll create a class uh, mm, let's just say person mm, okay and we have a method sort of one way method property of uh, I don't know data we need to give type of integer let's just say data is a uh, integer default is zero we need to initialize it if not then we have to do like something like this if you don't want to initialize it no yeah it cannot be abstract so i need to initialize it okay in the case of questions you can set it as null that's for the null safety okay 
so now you see this is a class person but if you see right what is the issue in here let me just give you that issue thing in here okay hmm so I'll create a variable where person of type person is equal to person okay I'll create a constructor which will take uh, data of type integer and I'm just gonna do 30 here data is age okay nothing else okay now what do you think uh, is wrong in here okay so I'm just sending ages data what if uh, person wants to send like this it's wrong in all sorry person string I'll just say okay it's wrong in every way because you cannot say it's a good thing but it's again a bad thing I mean you cannot use this you know if you're if you're a Java script developer or something this is perfectly right I think but here you cannot use it I mean that's just you know kind of disadvantage right I mean so what you gonna do so here you'll be like okay let me create the another another class with person 2 and you know that should be string but that's you don't really think it's a lot of complications yeah so let's do this uh, with a way of generic okay so instead of this I'll define a new type T and it instead of integer I'll just say data is a type T you know and this is a type T okay uh, data of type T that's it right now what is T in here okay T is a user defined type okay so for you can just say T Y also it doesn't matter you know but just in generics that's how we define T you know uh, generic uh, type with T that's why I'll just keep it T only okay now what does this mean now if you think right uh, now it's showing error in both the both the you know variable that we are defining why because see now this class is a generic or type T okay where data can be any type so I, I have to specify here the now here the data is integer okay so see it's very easy these all triangles right it's defining the data this is not required because uh, based on 30 you know the compiler will figure it out that this is a generic and the type here is integer but in this case we need to give string right and now if you see it's not required but just try to put it you know because that's like the standard way of doing things because if you don't write this then you have to write this this time right so okay so now you know is both are required right so person now can accept data as a integer as well as string so this is like a generic you know it defines uh, generalize the type of data a class can have or something like that so you don't need to create a lot of other variables and flags and all those kind of things which makes things messy right so this is how generic works in the class this is like the basic of how to def how to declare you know and define the generic and how to use the generics in the uh, in the functionality right let's define a generic in the function okay so I'll create a function uh, some sort of I don't know print details or something okay so here it's the same thing you have to first declare then you give a name of uh, the function that you want uh, I don't know uh, sort okay now so data is type T okay and just whatever the thing that you want to do and you can actually not just that you can even return as it is uh, a definition of the function okay let's not go with the return but you can write it down uh, I'm just going to tell you know how to define and you do all the sorting functionality based on you know if it's integer or it's a float or whatever right uh, and then you return so how are you gonna use it uh, let's see oops just calling a function sort over integer okay 30 right see and I'm gonna do sort or float mm, 30 4 dot 
fire oops it should be triangle okay so as you can see this is how we do that okay so it's not float so you have to write f to make it float yeah see so in this way i'm just writing one function using that i can use it so this is how generics works okay and then here or in here right now it up up to you based on different different types you know you want to do that uh, okay now uh, let's go with another example you know what if this type sorting works on numbers right what if this type is a string you know uh, is, you know in this case this is still a valid thing you know uh, I mean but you don't want to sort strings right I mean if you see right the technically it is possible but logically if you think it's just the wrong thing so you, you don't want it to be like you know uh, this thing so what do you do actually you provide the where condition you know where t is, where t should be number right so as you can see I'm actually putting a condition now uh, and t should be comparable of t right so this is again a generic thing you know that i'm passing on so comparable is some kind of like you know interface uh, where it can compare so as you can see right this gets complex you know but you can just do something like this so this is how you add conditions so now string is not allowed as you can see right this is not within its bound so what you are doing in here is actually actually you are constraining your so you are generalizing t but you don't even want anything other than number or any type that is implementing the comparable method you know so this is how you provide upper bounds in you know uh, generics and this is how you kind of do generics in the Kotlin this is like the basics you know but this is way more useful when you have like you know compound data types or or you know hash functions or maps and you know all those kind of collection kind of data types right because collections are a generalized thing you know for example hash map can be can store string as well as number as well as float as well as any custom type you know so uh, as far as it meets some boundaries which are these conditions you know bounds right yeah so this is guys how generics works in sort of like kotlin uh this is like the basics uh i'm pretty soon will be launching an advanced kotlin class where i'll be using generics a lot like literally a lot this is just a pure definition of generics if you want to know more you gotta go and read it out on what generics in oop generally is how it can be used and then you can actually come to the kotlin but syntax wise this is it guys I'm, i mean there are like you know generics inside generics like we have used this right comparable so t i'm passing is you know so it can be used no big deal but uh, yeah this is it uh, when it comes to generics basics yeah so thank you guys i'll see you next tutorial